Hello, everybody, and welcome to the finals of the 2022 Spring Fling. I'm Michael Hoype. I'm joined today by Michael Flores. Say hi, my Michael. Hi, Michael. This is Michael. <laughs> yes, so I do have the bracket up of what we have for our top eight. I will briefly go over the, the players that we're going to be highlighting in this uh, match today. We On the left side, we have uh, Tom Matelski on the Devourer combo. So he fought through uh, Enchantress. Uh, in the quarterfinals matches, and then he battled against uh, the Mono Blue Stifle Knot in the semifinals. And Tom is facing up against Connor Abbott Brown on Turtle Splash, which uh, Connor played against Goblins in the quarterfinals, and then he played against Sly in the semis. So we have two combo decks that are facing off against each other in the finals of this tournament. We had 99 players to begin with, and they played... Uh, eight rounds over two batches. So they played eight rounds of Swiss similarly, and then they did the, the top eight. So we're down to two players, and we're looking to see which one of these combo decks is going to be crowned the Spring Fling champion. All right, so Michael, so you have kind of jumped feet first into the pre-modern world, and it's probably a little overwhelming of how many different decks that people are playing. We have... Two kind of exciting decks. One is a little bit more well known to the pre-modern world in the the form of the Phyrexian Devourer combo. But only in the last year, right? So prior to that, people were asking me, "What do you even tinker for?" <laughs> or that was a question someone asked me. I'm like, "Well, you can't play Mana Vault. You can't play Grim Mot. What are you even tinkering for?" Right? So Devourer is what you tinker for now, and you do other things with it. You survival for it sometimes, um, but. Yeah, that it, this is like the default fast kill combo deck in pre-modern these days, right, Michael? Yes, it is probably, of consistent combos, it's one of the, the fastest. Uh, it can potentially kill on turn two with the sequence of like Ancient Tomb and a Altar and then a, a Tinker on turn two uh, to get like the... Tinker for anything, right? Yep. That's uh, off of a fast mana play. So... Uh, the way that that deck works is it gets a card called Phyrexian Devourer, which is from Alliances onto the battlefield. Phyrexian Devourer has a prohibitively high casting cost, but you, you just don't cast it usually, and a prohibitively small power and toughness. But so long as you have some cards in your library, it can give itself plus one, plus one counters. It has an artificial condition that you have to sacrifice it at a certain size. But wait! You can put that on the stack, and you just fling somebody or Altar of Dementia them to death before you actually have to sacrifice it. Yeah, so the ways, yeah, it's either Alter of Dementia or Fling is the way that it's going to kill someone. I'm going to bring up the, the deck list for everyone to see. I think the first one that I have is the Devourer deck. So uh, what the, a, a lot of artifacts so that it can support the, the Tinker, and then pretty much a little some disruptive pieces in cards like Defense Grid and Tangle Wire, and then the rest is kind of blue smoothing with, with Impulse and then Intuition to, to find your combo pieces. So... Uh, there's not really a lot of chaff in this deck, and then there are certainly a lot of ways to produce multiple mana in terms of Ancient Tomb or City of Traders, and then even Crystal Vein, if you need to sacrifice it, you can add two mana. Yeah, like you said, you can use a City of Traders or an Ancient Tomb to just put Ulcer Dementia on the battlefield on the first turn, which costs two mana, and then use that same thing for two mana plus, you know, one mana from uh, some sort of artifact in order to uh, just cast a Tinker and and get the Devourer and play and kill them really quickly on turn two. All right, I am playing with my audio settings. Uh, I've had a common issue of that I'm louder than everybody else, so I'm going to... I can't get... I can't boost the uh, Michael's microphone, so I'm going to just turn mine down a uh, little bit. Michael, Hoy, you know that you could just... We could just record, record it through, and then you can strip the audio uh, component out uh, put the audio component through level later, or you can send it to me. I'll put it through level later and then re-add the audio. Uh, <laughs> that that will actually smooth it out for you. Okay, I can I can try that. I also had a suggestion that uh, I could just stop yelling. Is what I was told. So no, 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 <laughs> no. Well, for real, no. right? So yeah, I... yeah, yeah. I've seen yeah the, with the um, I know a little bit about it I've, with the editing that I've done, but yeah, we can do that so that when it makes it to YouTube, I, that it's uh... I could make Roman Fusco do it for okay. me. So Roman is a professional audio engineer. He actually does work for Marvel and and Wizards itself. Uh, and I make him do podcasts with me also, but I, I could be like Roman, fix fix this so that uh, the Spring Fling Finals looks great and sounds better. <laughs> okay. 
So I will bring up the deck list of the Turtle Splash deck. So uh, I think when I told you the decks that we're playing, you said, what is a Turtle Splash? <laughs> because this is uh, did. not a name or a deck that probably a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, this is a, a deck that Connor has built and tuned. He's played it in multiple tournaments, and uh, he has found a version that is he's sitting in the finals. So it, it's pretty exciting whenever you kind of... So e either make a deck or adjust it that you're able to do well with it. So Connor is like the the personal incarnation of the Turtle Splash. Like this would be like specifically playing against Aaron Dix with Urza's Bobble Mono Red. Like that that's what we're seeing here. Yep. Yep. The master of this particular strategy, uh, showing it off. Uh, so I I found out from Connor only this morning that despite there being no turtles in this deck, there are turtles pictured on the card Gamekeeper. Yes, so that that is where um, the turtle splash is coming from. We talked about this a little bit, but like turtle splash is actually a cereal. I mean, I don't know what marketing department thought like, hey, turtle splash is is gonna really sell the cereal, but uh, it, it's a thing. And so um, with the tradition of combo decks having a cereal name, that is oh, how turtle splash uh, kind of like came that. to be. I like that. You know, in the tradition of like a fruity pebbles or a tricks or a splinter twin <laughs> uh, so yeah that that's great to hear uh, okay so, so i guess i was gonna say the the um the turtle splash deck i'll, I'll kind of walk everyone through what what it's trying to do so if if step one is get a surprise and bailiff in play and that is a five mana card that when it comes into play it's going to remove all artifacts and enchantments from the graveyards but when it leaves play it's going to return all artifacts and enchantments to their owner's hands. So what Connor's going to do is when the bailiff comes into play, he's going to respond to a trigger and, and sacrifice the bailiff. And that would, before everything gets exiled, it's going to come back to his hand. And he, ideally he's going to return cards like Lotus Petal and Lion's Eye Diamond or a card like Dance of the Dead or Animate Dead. Those go back to his hand. The bailiff goes to the graveyard. He then animates it. It comes back. There's a trigger that he responds to. And then there's a loop that he's able to profit by either gaining life or gaining mana or milling his opponent with Altar of Dementia. So it's an infinite combo with different pieces because there's, I mean, like redundancy in terms of Closet Kicks or Altar of Dementia. And then either you can get, uh, you can get the bailiff into play with Gamekeeper, which when it dies, you flip cards until you hit a creature. And or just he has Oath of Druids. Um, don't know if Oath of Druids will really uh, trigger very many times in this match, but um, it, against other decks, it can provide a quick bailiff. So Connor's deck has Suppress and Bailiff, which costs five, and Gamekeeper, which costs four. So it sounds to me like his previous matchups against Sly and Goblins, which are both creature decks, were really helping him to leverage his Oath of Druids. Whereas it sounds like Connor's going to have to play a little bit fairer in his stage one uh, in this matchup because he's not going to be able to lean on both of Druids. He's going to actually have to cast his cards like Garfield intended. Um, I was very surprised at the speed and consistency that Connor has demonstrated in this top eight. I think, I, I think he comboed off on like turn three multiple times. I can't remember if he comboed off on turn two. I, I, but it, it's been very fast. It's been very gamekeeper based and like it, he's just been, Ancient Tombs and Lotus Petals, and he's really powered out the the game people. I think there was one time where he had Lion's Eye Diamond, and he cast an Intuition, and then he responded by cracking it, and then getting a Animate Dead, and kind of like set things up in the loop. But in terms of a fair game or whatnot, he does have four copies of Cobalt Therapy, which are great in the sense of they help him do his thing. Like you can sacrifice a creature. Yeah, you can uh, creature. Yes, so that can help with Gamekeeper continuing the chain so you get the Bailiff. But in, in this matchup, uh, Hand Disruption is great. I mean, when you have a, a straight combo deck, being able to strip a card out of their hand is really powerful. And then there's also four copies of Duress. So while tur uh, Turtle Splash, even if it is on average maybe a little bit slower than the Devour combo, having those eight Disruption pieces, I think, uh, allow it to uh, kind of definitely have a good shot of taking down any of the, the games against the combo other combo deck. Oh, that's a good point. So I thought that the devour combo was just faster. And also 
Connor was not going to be able to leverage his other druids at all. So I guess duress and cabal therapy are going to serve to try to slow down Tom's combo and maybe give him some some time to get his own combo off. Uh, is it accurate to say that Connor's combo was bigger? Is it literally just bigger than the than the, the devourer combo? Uh, it only by a, a small amount. They're both like pretty big because they're both both usually combos that you win. I guess in the sense that like Tom needs to have an altar or a fling when. Typically, if Connor's getting to that point, he typically wins, I guess. Uh, well, so Tom could not easily alter of dementia out a Battle of Wits deck, but Connor could with no greater difficulty than he would be able to to uh, combo out Flint Espel. Like, they're, they're of equal, equal yes, difficulty. Yes, that, like, uh, while Tom's is finite in that he has a certain number of cards in his deck for fling or alter that, and but Connor can loop it as much as he wants. So should uh, we let, let these guys know that they're ready to play? Yeah, let's, uh, let's, I'll jump down to the, the match. If you want to let our players know that they can get started, I am going to uh, bring up my card fetcher. We have... Tom Matelski on the left with the Devourer deck, and then Connor on the right with the Turtle Splash deck. It looks like Connor has mulliganed once as he puts one card on the bottom. So even though we're playing with cards from um, 1996 to 2003, is that about is that about the range? Yes. Uh, we're using uh, contemporary Magic the Gathering rules. Okay. So Tom has started. Is that a jeweled amulet being cast by a beautiful city of brass? Y yes. Jeweled Amulet is the build your own mocks <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, what's the card next to Jeweled Amulet? I, that is a oh, chromatic, sphere. chromatic Sphere, yeah. All right, so uh, that's a really nice City of Brass uh, retail on that. I'm going to say $200. Yeah. A lot of uh, the players that have been played pre-modern, they're invested, do like um, just the, all the old frame cards. And if they can get the original arts, they do, they do prefer it. So we do have a City Brass on the other side, and so, Cabal Therapy is going to be how Connor kicks things off. So Connor responds with a gold-bordered City of Brass uh, <laughs> and a, a Cabal Therapy. Cabal Therapy has been called by Robin Lund recently the best card in Free Modern. Uh, I certainly enjoy casting it. It's a lot of fun. It makes me feel good when I hit cards. Um <laughs> The fact that the fact that you have to qualify it <laughs> causes me to uh, question about whether or not it's the best card in pre-modern. I will also point out that in the last two tournaments you've played, you played green creature decks both times. The one that you didn't have Gabal Therapy seemed to be doing a lot better. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's still a card that, like, it's you're never sad to have Cabal Therapy because you always can interact with no matter what you're playing. And uh, it does keep some of the fair deck, deck or the unfair decks in check, I feel like, so... so. Tom follows up with a ancient tomb. I'm going to put that at seventy five dollars. Uh, and no further action. Are we going to pass on this one? Yeah, it looks like the rest of the cards in his hand. He does have a devourer, another city, and then I think it's a tangle wire, uh, which I guess he does have the potential to play. But he's the timing with with um, tangle wire is always interesting of when you want to deploy it because the the first turn, you're going to tap the most permanents, but it's also when your opponent has the least amount of permanents. So it's kind of trying to find the right time to deploy it for the initial turn. So that would be a terrible tangle wire right now. Connor's played a, a Lion's Eye Diamond and two copies of Claws of Gix, uh, all of which cost zero. This leads me to believe that Tom might side out all of his tangle wires. There's a lot of zero casts and cost artifacts in Connor's deck that would allow him to just pay for tangle wire with relatively little... Uh, negative impact to his own game plan or does that even turn off clause of it doesn't right like, no you can still clause as much as you want if it's tapped or not uh impulse is the play from tom uh taking i i assume 400 damage from casting the impulse uh one for blue and then i think 399 additional damage from the ancient tomb uh but he'll look at the top four cards of his library maybe one of them is, is going to be exciting yeah, at this point, he's looking for, I guess, Alter Dementia is probably the easiest way, because then he could play that first and then eventually get to six mana to cast the Devourer. He has to kind of do it relatively quickly, though, right? So the Devourer in hand is actually one of the worst places for a Devourer to be, because you, act you actually have to 
cast it if it's in your hand and it's again prohibitively expensive we don't know how much it costs to cast a devourer uh it, it's a far far greater than a number you would actually want to actually have to tap your mana for uh, even if you were uh building your own mocks and uh ancient tomb type person so what do we have here that's he has six mana actually right so uh two from no 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 there's not only five uh two from ancient tomb two more from lands and then one from the jeweled amulet from yeah. the jeweled amulet so that's only five that's uh not enough to go off here yet uh is it tangle wire now yeah it is now tangle wire time i i, I fear the tangle wire is not going to be doing too much here well um, you're but... at least getting one of his lands that oh, he is tapping the scary that is the one that can produce two mana so i think that's uh probably saying that connor is not planning on using his mana this turn I would agree. Is that Pete Bog? Yes. So the yeah, when when Connor gets a full untap, it's going to be bad times for Tom. Yep. And the, yeah, the next turn he'll just be able to top tap the Claws of Gix and the Lion's Eye Diamond. And the Lion's Eye Diamond, you can still use the Claws of Gix. You can still use when they're tapped. So. Yeah, this is among the worst matchups I've ever seen for Tangle Wire. All right. City of Brass going off. Oh, no, it's just getting tapped for Tangle Wire. I guess it's not going off. It's the opposite. Actually, do you take damage when you have to tap the City of Brass yes, for you Tangle Wire? You do? Yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's a non bow. Uh, there was a match that uh, I think uh, Patrick Lennon Johnson versus. Uh, David Williams uh, in 1998, where Dave Williams beat Pat Patrick Johnson playing Cadaverous Bloom by uh, doing some sort of tapping with buyback on his City of Brass like 20 times. <laughs> like I'm not not kidding. Like against Cadaverous Bloom, uh, so which was the premier combo deck of the era. Yeah, it's it's. I like it when people find creative ways to win and <laughs> like <laughs> tapping a City of Brass. Like, uh, what was he was he tapping it with a Russian mind board or with oh mind games. Okay, mind so games. So okay. Dave Williams was like, trying to be such a baller that he was going to try to win with a pre-constructed deck called the Dominator. Uh, so I don't know what else was in the Dominator, but he mind games with buyback twenty times the City of Brass against a deck that grew up on mind games. All right. Meanwhile, we have uh, a Cabal Therapy was passed. Oh, he danced the dead. Um, Tom's de own devourer. Okay, that's why that's in play. Okay, oh. so <laughs> dance of the dead can target uh, both graveyards. So this is a uh, almost exactly uh, mind games with buyback. Your city of brass uh, <laughs> route to victory. Yeah, this is this is not plan A for the turtle slash oh, deck. So. <laughs> this is sexy. I mean, Connor is playing an alter of dementia deck, so he might just be able to put the combo together on that yeah. one. Yeah, he certainly doesn't want to activate the Devourer and Exile Bailiff, but um, I mean, he couldn't. He, if there's a Devourer in play on his side of the battlefield, can't he just cast Alter of Dementia and have a yeah. pretty high likelihood of winning? Yes, yeah, his deck I, has ridiculous casting cost cards that cost two, four, five that he can get it big enough. Yeah, I think he would be able to just uh, basically use Tom's combo against him. Yeah, I, um, I, I think that that is a, a way to do it. This, this was not this an angle that exciting. I thought was going to happen, but yeah, it's. Oh, uh, I like it. <laughs> I like it. Which would you be more excited if if Connor combo killed Tom with his own combo, or if the Phyrexian Devourer just like beat him down over a few turns? I think that any victory where Connor uses Tom's uh, Phyrexian Devourer to win would be very exciting. I think that beating him down is less exciting because it's less insulting. I think like. <laughs> You get the full amount of insult to injury if you if you use Alter Dementia because I think that's really like a weapons of your enemy sort of situation. Because um, well, actually, he's on like about a three turn clock, right? The mm -hmm. you know he can probably plausibly pump it to the point that it's not going to kill itself, but still uh, deal deal some damage because he can see Tom's just got like a fling here, right? Yep. Uh, there's there's no immediate route to victory. I'll, I don't know. I guess Tom is probably an impulse or a tinker away from winning though. So. Yeah, he he does have the altar too. He that he just played. So 
he's just looking for a way to get uh, a new devourer into play. So I, th- oh, I mean, that defense grid is not long for this world. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. All right. right. So we got. Here a, comes Devourer. These are natural activations. So we see a Duress is going to be exiled. <laughs> Get a counter on your Devourer. Plus one, plus one. <laughs> Taste it. So he's just attacking for two. Is there. I try to think if there's any risk to, to go bigger, but. I, the, the risk is that you accidentally kill it. Oh, also, yeah. Dance of the Dead does give it plus one, plus, plus one. Plus one, plus one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yep. So it's. Uh, it is three damage that it's attacking for. I would be putting it in like the six range personally, or I'd be trying to. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be greedier than that. But because I guess if you accidentally like flip a five or something, you're you're in bad times though. Unless you drew another Dance of the Dead. I think that's a no idea what's in Connor's <laughs> hand. I am just baffled at the thought that this game is just gonna finish with co- combat damage. So. <laughs> I actually just thought that Tom was like a huge favorite because his deck seemed faster to me, but I just completely discounted the <laughs> reanimate your dude. Let's go. <laughs> okay, so it looks like the the devourer has uh he has a different Except- purpose now. He's he's flashing back a cobalt therapy. So to get the fling? I mean it it's still like the the out is still tinker at this point that Yeah, uh, it seems awful to me. You can still beat him with the with the altar in play, right? Yeah, I don't unless there's a library situation I'm not perceiving. Yeah, I don't even know if that cuts out any outs cuz like I I don't think it does. Oh, okay. I mean, I don't know, like maybe there's some library situation that I I have not counted, but the fling is not more lethal than the altar of dementia that's in play. I'm trying and... to think I don't think I'm trying to think if there's a way that Connor like kills in the upkeep, or I don't think he has any ways to shuffle. But there's, I mean, the situation at hand doesn't seem like, like I, I think that that's a fine play if you're just going to immediately animate deaded again or something, right? But that's not what he did. Mm-hmm. All right, okay. so Connor gets another turn, so no tinker was drawn, and. Just adding another land. But it's not just him. Oh, no. oh he, Gamekeeper. He, not just oh, adding the, another land. Okay. Oh, he just wanted to get the... Okay, so... Uh, there is a Cabal Therapy in Graveyard still, yes? Yes. So he's going to use the Cabal Therapy in Graveyard to probably go off with Gamekeeper, right? Yeah, it, he also has Claws of Gifts, which does cost him a mana, but like, yeah, the Cabal Therapy is the cleaner way to, to keep things going. All right, here it goes. So the thing that is an underrated kind of plan B about Cabal Therapy is you can miss when you're Cabal Therapying with a card like Gamekeeper. And it doesn't really matter if you miss or not because you're you're naming the card that will beat you, not the card that you think that they have in hand at that point. Okay, so the, so if you miss... I was going to say, the Bailiff showed up, and it showed up very quickly. So I'm trying to... This is the point where like I have to put my hat on and analyze and say, like, is there enough pieces in play for Connor to loop this combo? And so there is, we did see the Dance of the Dead in the graveyard, and he does have a Lion's Eye Diamond. So I think he's able to gain infinite life at this point, because the Lion's Eye Diamond gives him three mana. He's able to sacrifice for one mana, and the Dance of the Dead would cost two. So I think he's able to gain infinite life from this point, which, if that's all he has, isn't quite enough, because Tom still could draw Tinker and then mill out Connor. Just kill him with the... uh... Alter Dementia that's yep. still in play, right? Uh, yeah, so he would need like kind of a more offensive way to, to do it. All right, so looks like Bailiff Trigger. Right, do you see the cards that are up front? Those the are the um, the indicators that Connor uses to like um, say like these triggers are on the stack. One of them is the Claws of Gix, and then one of them is the, the Bailiff Leaves play trigger i think so he's just visualizing what is what is happening yes i think that you should mandate that all of your players have (laughs) these kinds of kinds of things for both viewers at home and the the convenience of their opponent actually okay so is 
is the red dice on Tom's side? Is that indicating Connor's life total? Yeah, that's um, though. Yeah, Tom has Connor at eighteen, though Connor has him up at seventeen. But then, yeah. Oh, um, you know what makes sense is he wanted to get the Dance of the Dead into the graveyard. Well, it that's already. He, oh, that, yeah, that's why he used yeah, the that, it was on the Devourer, so he wanted to get it in the graveyard. So it, actually, that play makes a lot more sense if you know that Connor was going to try to go off with his natural combo the next turn, which, to be fair, is probably better than a medium slow Devourer attack plan. Especially if you're using the Devourer, you might accidentally exile key combo pieces that you don't want to exile. That's a possibility. So I'm reading chat. They're saying, I don't know if I'm, is Dance of the Dead on the Devourer relevant now? Like he could, cause he can loop that and he can do that eventually, but that doesn't change anything because he doesn't have an altar. So when I say he, I mean Connor in this instance. Okay. But I think he gained infinite life and now he's going to get a Devourer. I think that's where we're at. Oh, so that's actually pretty cool, right? So he leaves himself in the same game state that we had last turn when we were puzzled why he would sacrifice the Devourer just to take out a fling. Oh but my the answer God. is he's not in this... Oh, Tinker, well. Tinker has... Oh, goodness. <laughs> what did I always tell you, Michael Hoy? Yes. Duress and Cabal Therapy are just fine if your opponent <laughs> doesn't kill you the next turn. <laughs> wow. So with Connor unable to... to I mean, he comboed off in the sense that he gained infinite life, but uh, Tom had a way to to beat that, and he drew the one card he needed. I I don't know if it would have been the very last turn, but it likely would have been. Like I think the likelihood of Connor able to kill just with natural damage what, the next is, turn was very is, high. Is Tom on two? Is that the green die is indicating that he's on two? Probably would have died to an attack. Yes. So this would be the last turn. And uh, what's going to happen now is there's a Devourer that's being tinkered into, into play. Um, Tom is going to go through the motions of getting it to a certain size. Uh, what's the terminal point on Devourer? Seven power, I believe? Yes. Yeah, so as, once he gets to seven power, then he has to do an in-response set of stacks because there's a trigger that the Devourer has to sacrifice itself. But before that trigger of sacrificing itself will be resolved, presumably Tom has enough cards in his library that... Uh, he can exile enough just to deck Connor using the Altar of Dementia that we mentioned was already been in play since, you know, an early turn. Yeah, there, there are some instances if games go really long or if you sideboard out some number of Hyrexian Devourers that your CMC of your deck isn't high enough, but I don't think that'll be an issue uh, it in this game like one. It doesn't look like here. So, ooh, a Fell War Stone, that's two power. Defense grid, two power. One power. Two power. I'm just naming how much the cards. <laughs> so as the devourer will grow to the point where more cards than than Connor's deck, and then the altar of dementia will be used to sacrifice the devourer, and that will mill out Connor. So I think you might have seen uh, a second ago. It looked like Connor was touching his his gold uh, his gold sleeved cards a moment ago, and I believe he was probably telling Tom how many cards were in his library. Okay. So that Tom would have an educated uh, amount of, amount of data to how much he had to use the devourer for. So, uh, among the most swingy games I've seen in a long time, uh, it looked for a second like Connor Abbott Brown was going to win that game with Brexian Devourer beatdown, an inexplicable sacrifice of a, a plausible clock and play, taking away the only card in his opponent's hand, knocking him down to two, then going off on a near infinite combo. Uh, with Gamekeeper and Surpraz and Bailiff gaining a prohibitively high amount of life, opponent on a one-turn clock, just kidding, Tinker for the kill. <laughs> yes. Can't stop the top of the deck. So when you say that Connor's, Connor's combo is bigger, like, it wasn't big enough, I guess, in this it instance. So, enough, right? so. I th that is part of, I think, like with the, the variability with the Gamekeeper and the Oath of Druids or whatnot, that like, if you do end up in situations, the bailiff can come too soon. Because if, I think in Connor's eyes, if he's milling more cards, like if there's an altar of dementia in that loop, he just needs he two just mana, two mana, and he wins the game. Uh, and if uh, he hits like 
even if he hits just another gamekeeper, he's able to continue going and get more cards in his graveyard, and that makes it much more likely that he has the tools that he needs to win on that turn. But the, the Bailiff showed up a little too soon, and Infinite Life was not enough. So talk to me about Connor's deck, right? So I know why someone would play Tom's deck. Tom's deck just from brass tacks, I mean, there was a copy of it in the top eight of the North American Pre-Modern Championship. First time I saw it uh, on, I think, like the Pre-Modern website, I had to uh, look up what a Devourer did. But then I'm like, oh, okay, this it, it, it was weird to me that the deck picked up in popularity so much. But I understand why someone would play it. Why would someone play Connor's deck other than you are the personal incarnation of this deck and you want to show off your creativity well well one f big factor is is like if someone's not familiar with the deck that you're playing which is very reasonable like some of connor's cards are very obscure uh, opponents are going to play worse against you like and I, I think that is something that he has experienced um consistently that people don't know how to play against it and the other uh benefit is not that his deck is completely immune to graveyard hate because there's certainly spots where a torment script is very um, problematic but like creature removal like source of postures doesn't do anything against him like because he will always have priority and can sacrifice th the gamekeeper or the bailiff and uh i guess you also could make that argument that tom is doing the same thing that like he's kind of blanking a card like source of postures but uh i think it's just the idea of attacking from a different angle that you do get a good edge and i i think i mean I don't know how consistent or like the average kill that Connor has with the with this list that he has, but the, I think the deck is much more consistent than maybe it just kind of looks on on first glance. So what are they doing here? So Tom has got a one and a three, and he split his deck into piles. Is that is that a convention of the pre modern on camera metagame? It is a uh, kind of a courtesy of. Uh, of offering a cut that your opponent has a way oh. of doing it so they have the the agency to put which pile they want so it's a, a courtesy that's kind of gained popularity that is pretty common on on the webcam game so that's amazing to me you guys have your own visual figurative language yep so, all right so tom is mulled to six and he's indicating that with a die yep and, uh, and duress will make his hand one card smaller so so he's basically starting with a five uh, again, gold bordered city of brass. First action uh, on Tom's side, we have uh, the city of traders. Uh, it's, 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 so we have Shivan Reef, Phyrexian Devourer, and city of traders, and then Tangle Wire, Jeweled Amulet, and Intuition. So, Would you take their Intuition? I think I think so. I think that is like we we talked about how Tangle Wire can be kind of miserable against Connor. That you just have some zeros to to pop into play, and Intuition is just kind of a catch-all in terms of it finds what you need, whether it's the Devourer or the Flinger, Ulther, or Tinker, or whatever you need, so. Shiv and Reef is the first play from Tom. Uh, isn't it... Would, would you deploy the amulet here? Yeah, I don't think there's any... He's deploying the amulet. I don't think there's any downside to... We're still playing game one, right? So there's no sideboard cards in. Correct. If we're... there were a, a relevant sideboard card, they haven't come in yet. Yep, we're playing a best of five, so the first two games are going to be without sideboard. All right, so Chromatic Sphere was the draw for Tom as he puts that into play as well. So he's kind of looking, I mean, he either needs a lot of mana and another card, or. Okay, so Duress will take out the Tangle Wire. Not. The most impactful, but it, I don't know when that's. I, I mean, you might. There might make a big case to say that to rest for later. So there's now an altar of dementia on Connor's side of the battlefield. Uh, okay, city of traders is playing that uh, mindstone. Mindstone. Mm -hmm. the, what's the remaining card in Tom's hand? It is a devourer. Okay, so we got one, two, three, four. There will be five mana in play next turn. Uh, that's certainly not enough to go off. From Tom's perspective, though. Okay, stuff's getting tapped. Yeah, it's and exciting. the one the one awkward thing with Tom having to play the City of Traders is he's not able to use like future turns to increase his mana because the City of Traders will have to sacrifice it yep. itself. So it's kind of awkward that he had to use it to deploy the Mind Stone. So but Connor has just gone off with Gamekeeper, right? So. The cast gamekeeper using a uh, gemstone mine city of brass, 
and uh, Ancient Tomb, which is four in total, and then sacrificed it. What mana did he use to sacrifice? Doesn't game keep the altar of dementia. He can. Oh, he has an altar yeah. of dementia yep. in play. Yep, you're right. Oh, so this is rock and roll, right? Yeah, it's so, so it's not like it's not a hundred percent because things can go wrong. But we do see a lion's eye diamond and an animate dead in the graveyard. So I think that's as long as he so has. He's milling himself here, right? Yep. In order to, in order to get a fuller and fuller. Uh, fuller and fuller graveyard for purposes of the eventual uh, big surprise and bailiff. So, well, the the milling is based off the gamekeeper trigger. I don't think he's targeting himself with the altar because there's just a, a chance that he might mill the the bailiff and that would cause problems. So, but yes, his he is milling more cards thanks to the gamekeeper triggers. Uh, oh, so are these all in response to each other? Because it doesn't seem to me that Tom has done anything with his graveyard yet. Or I'm sorry, his library. He, yeah, I don't know if, it, yeah, maybe that the the activations haven't been resolved. resolved. This is actually really interesting because just doing like a decent amount of milling of Tom's deck, like just kind of chip shot milling, uh, might be meaningful in terms of reducing Tom's library to the point that the Devourer is no longer lethal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there. Uh, if things get really lucky, then that could be, but. I don't think Connor will have to... We're not going to get there. Yeah, we don't, he doesn't need to resort to, <laughs> to luck this time. It's just uh, he's got everything he needs. So uh, the the Bailiff, I'll bring that one up. So with the he's going to be able to get all the artifacts and enchantments from his graveyard. Uh, that will include Lion's Eye Diamonds and some number of Lotus Petals likely. So if there's two Lotus Petals in there, that's two mana to cast an Animate or Dance of the Dead. And then he's able to do this loop. So you put a... Lion's Eye Diamond and there, then you have infinite mana. That, not that he really needs it. He's just able to do this loop, gain infinite life, and mill Tom out with the Altar of Dementia. So, Oh, and he's getting Oath of Druids back as well. Uh, that's just good form. Yeah. Uh, that Oath of Druids is never going to get to an upkeep wherein it will trigger, but, you know, this is, a, this is the old uh, play magic properly situation. This is very exciting. So uh, the bailiff is, he's, I guess he's showing the folks at home how many things the bailiff is getting back. But I think Tom just sees the writing on the wall and or. Yep. I think they're that. just, they're going through the, the loop just so they can demonstrate for everyone. I think in the future games at this point, Tom would be scooping it up. But I think they're just kind of showcasing how everything is, is going. I'm not sure what cards we're milling right now because it looks like Connor's milling his own deck, but uh, I think he has all the tools that he needs to to just kill Tom at this point. Yeah, like you said, as long as there is north of a Lion's Eye Diamond, uh, he can just keep getting back the Bailiff with Animate Dead or Dance the Dead. That costs two, right? So, and then before the, the relevant triggers are done. Oh, I think there isn't a cycle Lotus Petal. So the the mana is a bottleneck. So it is. Oh, maybe he milled himself in order to just get get artifact mana. Yeah, he was looking for a second lotus petal because he, he's not able to cast the dance of the dead right now because the lion's eye diamond you have to discard your hand to, to use it. So he needs two mana to get started, and then he'd be fine. But he only had one oh mana gosh. because of one lotus petal. So, so Tom has a turn. Yeah. So That's all those me? all those cards got milled, and only one of the lotus petals were were found. So. Is, is Tom going to be able to do it again? Well, I think, like, Connor's in a messed up situation, right? It's not just that he can't go off. Like, he can't respond to... It. His deck is predicated on timing as well as a combination of cards, right? If his stuff resolves, doesn't it mess up his... Well, he has the Bailiff in the graveyard, and he has uh, the Animate Dead or Dance of the Dead in his hand. And so he'll have it mana from his lands next turn. So he'll have... Ooh, the less used option on Mindstone was just opted in. Sacrifice to draw a card. That is a sign of a desperate player. Yeah, and given the, the rest of the cards that Tom has, I don't think he'll have what he needs to, to finish Connor off from this position. So it, it's funny that, like, 
when I was talking about the turtle splash and how I was surprised on the speed and consistency of it, we've seen the speed half this. Yeah. The speed, but the, some unfortunate sequences of, of Connor flipping cards that he didn't get exactly what he needed. And he's had to pass the turn after he's comboed. Uh, he was punished once in game one. I don't think we will see the same thing happen in the second game, but I'm not going to call it until we're done playing. I mean, like he's, literally choosing a card from impulse like if you're in some of those situations like i didn't see what i wanted you start picking up your cards at that point but he put it in his hand he's saying go all right let's see connor abbott brown what do you got here so yeah my understanding is here now he has enough because he's able to cast the animate dead or the dance of the dead here and now he's able to respond with uh, the lion's eye diamond so now there's extra mana in the loop and now he's able to chain chain it so with the English translation of that is just no fun. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're Connor, which is lots of fun. People love the Turtle Splash deck. I think this is this is what people would, would call fun. I don't know. Yeah? <laughs> so, okay. Michael, you probably have a greater range and span in your experience of playing the pre-modern format than anybody else in the world. Flint Espel, <laughs> the North American pre-modern champion, tips his hat and, and concedes... The format expertise, the the princedom of pre-modern, let's say, <laughs> to yourself, my friend. Uh, what is fun? You, you describe to me what is fun in pre-modern. Uh, is attacking with a rouge elephant fun? Oh, well, for certain. Every now and then, if you get to attack with a one mana 3-3, three, three, I would call that fun. Um, but, I don't know, it's... Uh, fun is... I don't know uh just i like winning but i'll do it in different ways i don't i just like to i, I think that you do not like winning as <laughs> yeah. much as you like something else you came to lobster con <laughs> packing the rock you could have brought anything if you liked winning you would have chosen one of the infinite other decks that you own that you knew would have had a better chance of winning you you came with the rock because you wanted to prove something don't know what I played the rock because I wanted to play play long games of magic. That was the, that was the idea. Um, I don't know if this sounds kind of arrogant, but I'm like, I didn't want people to get excited to play against me, and then we have them like stasis them out, and that would be their first live inter interaction with me. That was one of the things that that ran if through I my were mind. Just a so fan of the Cloud Goat Ranger, like I had just only ever interacted with you by watching your YouTube videos. If you played a first turn Rouge Elephant against me, I think I would have been maximally excited. <laughs> Here's a se separate question. More exciting. Invigorate, a card you don't play, or Bounty of the Hunt, a card that only you play? Bounty of the Hunt, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so this tournament I'm playing in next week, uh, there was a spot open, and my friend who's running it asked me if Brian David Marshall would want to play. I didn't even ask him. Because I've been trying to talk to Brian David Marshall about pre-modern, and he's just like, his eyes roll up. Like, what the hell are you talking about, right? So he texts me like two nights ago. He's just like, I'm in. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, I'm in. He's just like, and I'm like, huh? Like, I didn't even mention this to him. And he says, what's the aggroist deck that you could play, right? Like, well, Koal has this stompy deck. So I, I text Koal, and he's like, actually, Hoip is in the finals of this thing with his stompy deck, right? So I'm, so I'm like, send, I send BDM Koal stompy deck, which I had from before LobsterCon, right? And I'm like, is Hoyt playing your deck? He's like, oh, God, no. <laughs> he sends me this other deck. And BDM's like, I can play Bounty of the Hunt? <laughs> so I would be surprised if David Marshall, comma, Brian were not summoning Rouge Elephant and deploying some number of plus one, plus one counters for zero mana onto it a week from now in uh, palatial Brooklyn, New York. All right. He'll make you proud, Hoyt. Yeah, yeah. Uh... It's it's fun. <laughs> um, I I would not. I definitely would not pick that deck to win a tournament. Part of the reason is I try and play different decks as much as I can, uh, so that I can make a variety of YouTube videos. And it had been a very long time before I had played that deck. So, um, but you can play like you can play like kind of the Sky Shroud Elite River Boa Tangle Wire Mono Green deck with Invigorator. You could play your Rouge Elephant winter orb deck with invigorate those mm -hmm. were like completely different decks despite both being called stompy in fact i would argue they don't even have the same dna the number of card overlap between them is what giant growth 
they even play anything maybe kyrian ranger i don't know they, they don't play a lot of cards in common yeah I, I don't know how big the the other versions of stompy go but i guess all right i want to quick talk about sideboards as players are getting to their third game i have the devour deck combo or the devour combo deck up there are uh goblin welders rushing river and Tor- tormouth crypt is going to come in I know there's a deep analysis that are, is in Tom's sideboard that he's not been very happy with. Um, I don't think <laughs> those will be coming in. Uh, but that's the combat discard? I guess that's fair. That is something that you could... is a route you could take. The question is, if you're bringing these other cards, I don't know how many... Like, what cards you're cutting. That's like... I, you can shave a Devourer is pretty typical. Um, I don't think I would shave... I mean, I don't know what people do, but I wouldn't shave a Devourer. That's like... I guess that's usually if games go long that you cut one, and that's not necessarily what you're looking to do in this matchup. Grand Prix uh, Pro Tour and Masters Champion Dr. Michael Pastilnik, comma PhD, once told me that the biggest problem people playing combo decks have is that they shave their shave away their consistency. Okay, right? They're like they try to be more clever, but I don't know. Yeah, um, T- Tangle Wire is probably the first card to go. Uh, Goblin Welder seems more than okay to me. It seems like almost an acceleration piece. Uh, in this matchup, right? So if, for whatever reason, a Devourer gets into the graveyard. Yeah, and... um, Okay, I was going to say that it could, like, help him maybe against Connor's plan, but uh, I guess it wouldn't... If he got milled... Maybe if it, if I was, Devourer gets animate deaded again? <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess if Connor tries to mill out Tom, and Tom has an active welder and a fling in his hand. Oh, I guess, no, because he would have infinite life. It would be fine, so... All right. Talk to me about Stronghold Gambit in Connor's side. Okay, so this sideboard here, as I bring it up, there are it. I I think the idea is is when Oath of Druids is bad that the Stronghold Gambit comes in. Um, Players are starting, so I'm going to jump down in the match. We can dissect sideboarding maybe in a future game when they're shuffling, but we're going to kick things off with a duress uh, off a Gemstone Mine. Tom is going to show. Uh, an impulse which gets discarded as well as a felwar stone and mine stone and then devour and then two lands two city of Would you've taken the impulse in that spot i think so because like taking one of the mana rocks is not it's not like you're cutting him off in any sense and he's probably looking for an altar or we he does find a goblin welder that he's able to cast off his felwar stone it's always exciting love it uh man gemstone mine for duress that that's the kind of thing that could bite you man i remember the first time i played hickory woodlot in a ptq chris pakula was like he was mad the whole day i was in the finals of the ptq and he's just like playing hickory woodlot never bothered me the whole day and then in the finals i only drew hickory woodlots and then i just died with no land and played with my 26 land deep down deck um he's like he finally caught you i think that it was a similar situation with gemstone mine here uh, I think that a man who is tapping a gemstone mine for a duress on the first turn intends to win quickly. That's yep. Uh, a... Chad, Chad had asked, are we pod racing? And uh, maybe, yeah, if you're, you're not planning on having that gemstone stay yeah, in play. You, you are. That's a statement to yep. do that. I guess it's kind of on theme for all of Connor's lands. If he's got the Mercadian masks <laughs> ones and the gemstone, he just wants to get rid of his lands. He doesn't like them. They're <laughs> offensive to him. Okay. So, I mean, there's like a demi combo here where you can be using a uh, goblin welder in concert with some kind of a chromatic sphere mm-hmm. and or mind stone. And or, it's like a, a weird little like not very much mana generated, not very, very many cards generated situation, it's, but it's also not nothing. Yeah, it, it's, I, it would not be what I call pod racing. That would not. It's a, <laughs> it's kind of like a bicycle. That's probably what it is. But it's, just, but it's not nothing. Yes, he That's he would still be moving. Yes, it, yeah. it's slow, but yeah, it, he will. It's a, a little minor engine that he's got going. So, what's the last card in his hand? Is that a chromatic sphere? If it were, he'd play it, right? Uh, I didn't see it. He's oh, got it's a, a devourer. Sorry. Yeah, it's a, the devourer is the card he's seen, and then one unknown. Okay, we got a a full a full counters gemstone mine, a two counter gemstone mine, a two counters sappers and scary. Over on Connor's side, I, I find that battlefield to be kind of scary. Uh, from whose perspective? Everyone. Yeah, I was say I'm like, like that. If, if you own that battlefield, you're like, <laughs> this is not long for the world. 
If you're on the other side, maybe some maniac plays an alter of dementia against you and you're about to die. It, that's one thing that's kind of been difficult to, to grok is like how in danger you are against Connors. Like, cause things can go from zero to a hundred very quickly. Like an innocent board state can be just your dad in, in a blink of an eye. So, so, uh, wonderful use of the word grok. <laughs> uh, I'm actually reading a Robert Heinlein novel right now. I'm reading The Man Who Sold the Moon, uh, which is not Stranger in a Strange Land, but you know it, it's it's very, it's very it's both very Michael adjacent and Grok adjacent. Uh, so anyone who understood the last three sentences that I just said probably has a degree in American literature. I only know the word Grok from some commentator. I don't know if it was you or if it was someone it in the was past. Me. Okay, I was saying <laughs> it comes from uh, *Stranger in a Strange Land* by uh, Robert Heinlein. I was probably reading it at the time, uh, and it 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 means to know okay. in Martian, but it means both to know and to drink. <laughs> so in Martian, to know and to drink are like one thought, uh, and so when people say you really understand something if you grok it because you drank it and you know it. All right, so Powder Keg, that is one of the sideboard cards that Connor has available, has been cast. I guess in terms of what he usually plans to do with the... I, okay, so it is a way to get rid of Tormod's Crypt if it's played preemptively. Uh, I think that might be the initial thought. It, in this sense, situation, it is something that can answer Goblin Welder. Because I do think if the game is going to be going a number of turns, the Welder could be problematic for, from Connor's perspective. But I think the idea usually for Powder Keg is because of Torment Script. So you don't want it on two here if you're Connor. Connor has Ultra Dementia already in play. So you don't want to blow up the Ultra Dementia, which is the highest value to cast some cost artifacts in play right now. Uh, you also don't want it on zero. He has a Lotus Petal in play. And there's no zeros on the other side of the battlefield presently. Uh, one is probably the best option. Oh, okay. There is now a Devourer in play. <laughs> Will we see Devourer Aggro? Uh, is that a Tormod script? Yes, it is a Tormod script. Oh, I guess it's zero. <laughs> yeah. So, but he doesn't have to do it until he wants to do it, right? So that's a right. kind of a cool thing about this interaction. Tormod script sits there, and Powder Keg also sits there. Yeah, and it's a funny you talked about attacking with the Devourer, especially having a Goblin Welder in play. Um, if the Devourer were to die, I mean, you could just swap it out with one of the other artifacts and then try again the next turn. So so Devourer exiles cards from the top of the library. It doesn't just mill them. Yes. Right? If it milled them, that would be really, really good with, yes. uh, with Goblin Welder, but it does not do that. Okay, so we do see a counter from the, the Powder Keg. So it looks like... I have to imagine that he's planning on killing the, the Goblin Welder. Or he's planning to win. That's true. Well, so in this situation, if he's planning to win... Is he able to do it around a Tormod script? I that I don't know the answer. The po it's possible the answer is yes, um, but <laughs> I don't have the expertise with Turtle Splash enough to say that what the sequence would be for him to to play around Tormod script. I mean, how crazy is it from just to cast an Oath of Druids here with your trigger off of the Goblin Welder and then get a, a Symbiotic Worm in play? Yeah, it is certainly an angle. If if Tom, or uh, Connor is worried about disruption from Tom that. Uh, he can uh, operate on a different axis and try and get just a big creature into play. I think he has to kill Goblin Welder because otherwise uh, Tom can loop Tormod Script. That's actually the, the other issue, right? Okay. Any artifact availability would allow him to loop a repeated use of Tormod Script uh, so long as the Goblin Welder were untapped. I guess that's fair, yeah. That like, yeah, just blowing up even on the turn that you wanted to go off with a Welder active that it doesn't do much. Okay. So I think if there were an advantage bar, I would have it way uh, in the direction of Tom Mitelski right now. Uh, there is a Devourer in play. I think he can plausibly get maybe a four-turn clock here uh, with the Devourer. And um, Tormod Script is going to be at least plus one turns on fundamental turn for Connor. Uh, and uh, Which is just besides whether Tom can just draw a combo piece like Fling or Alter of Dementia. I think he's like way, way advantaged right now. Yeah, uh, um, he has a lot of live draws. I've, any fling, any tinker, any alter of dementia is just, it should be game over, I think. But it's not just that, right? So uh, Connor's primary route to not losing the game is to win the game himself. 
Uh, at the point that we're at right now, hard discard duress cabal therapy is going to be relatively meaningless because fling is instant and ulcer dementia doesn't give you a window, right? If he draws it, it's in play. So he actually has to just kind of win. Um, and that Tormod's Crypt is really, really bad for the trying to win fling. I think this is kind of like bait. I think uh, animate dead on the goblin welder, I think is what we're doing. Ooh. I guess it's not necessarily bait because it, it is a way to answer the... There is an artifact in Tom's graveyard, correct? This is a way uh, for him. Keg. Okay. Oh no, in in Tom's graveyard for him. Oh, oh if yeah. He, if sure. he needs to get rid of like the devourer. But uh, Chad had brought up that with an active welder, you can use it to disrupt Tom or Connor in the sense of like getting rid of a uh, altar of dementia. Uh, so. Oh, it's it's even better than uh, originally advertised. Then yeah. I, I think he has to use the. Tormod's Crypt, then? I mean, he's trading for Connor's whole turn. Yeah, I do feel like this is... Especially because he's in a pretty good position that I wouldn't feel bad about using my Tormod's Crypt in this spot. Yeah, I, th I think he should use it uh, separately. Connor has lost one of those gemstone mines already. Like, it's like I said before, it is scary for both sides of the battlefield. <laughs> Man, Tom is really tanking on this decision here. Well, I, I mean, like, the Torment script is probably something that made him feel very safe. And him getting rid of it, I think, is kind of making him uneasy. And that's probably what's causing some thought that you're kind of like, he, it's it's hard to to feel out if, the, like, what is the correct play in the spot. I'm not I'm not sure if it's, uh, I my gut is to say to use the Torment script, but I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, this is like, I was out at about 11, 11, 15 on Thursday night the other night. I looked up at the at the TV screen in the restaurant that I was in, and the Warriors were up by 10. And I got home, and then the Warriors had lost by 12. And I was just like, I did not predict that when I left the, <laughs> when I left the ice cream parlor, uh, that this was me when I saw. Um, I think it's one of those situations where the advantage bar still favors Tom, but the fact that he just got a favorable trade moves it towards Connor. So the player who, in our case, is going to be uh, the Boston Celtics, uh, down by 10, uh, loses a land, uh, loses a key combo piece, and yet the advantage bar is uh, is going uh, towards him. So I believe they are asking if, if Tom has sacrificed his own... Um... Tormod's Crypt, will it get exiled? I believe the answer is yes. Uh, it is in the graveyard before yeah. it resolves, yeah. yes. Yeah. So it's sacrifice speed is faster than... Uh, so it goes directly to the graveyard and then resolution happens. Yeah. Upon resolution, then it would be exiled. Yes. Uh, you could be a level one judge. Boy. <laughs> I don't know about additional levels, but you got that one. I, I, I'm going to dub you... Uh, Level one judge. All right. And so the, the Tormod script will get exiled and then we will continue going on. So, all right. So Tom's just looking for a number of cards. <laughs> Flings, intuitions, tinkers, uh, alter dementia. Those are all draws that will just win the game. Impulse is interesting, at least. Yeah, it, I mean, impulse is very exciting when I name four to five different cards that just win the game. Uh, impulse is pretty good. Uh, so he's sacrificing Mind Stone, so that gives another draw, but turns off like a card like Tinker uh, for an instant win. Uh, it looks like we're getting replaced with a Chromatic Sphere. All right, so Chromatic Sphere, again, turning off Tinker as an instant win. But, ki but it kind of, you know, replaces itself there. All right, so I think he's indicating there's mana available. Uh, Tormod script in play. Uh, advantage bar. Oh, oh. <laughs> Back way. Ah, no fun. <laughs> so zero fun. The chromatic sphere left, but uh, a Tormod script, while very good in the matchup, all it needed to be was a zero mana artifact. So tinker that away, and he's gonna find alter dementia, and then mill out Connor. So we've seen actually a lot of the sideboarding already taking place, but we can go over what happened there so uh from the perspective of tom zatelski uh tormod's crypt came so he, he only has two tormod's crypts they both showed up that game mm -hmm. 
Uh, he brought in some number of goblin welders. At least one showed up. There's a defense grid in his sideboard to go along with the three in his main deck. I would guess most of those left. Defense grid does not seem very good in this matchup to me. Okay, yeah, that, that's a card that yeah that makes sense to get to leave. Uh, the, the Pyroclasm, one... no text in this matchup. <laughs> He's not really going to be like, here's a game keeper, and then just like, here's a pyroclasm. Like, you don't even want a pyroclasm a game keeper. So I have a question on the strategic scoop. If you're Connor, are you? I would I would want to see some cards from Tom. I would want to get every piece of information for in terms of sideboarding and whatnot that I could. Uh, would you? The only question is whether or not he brought in Rushing River, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's you might get a sense of how many copies of cards or what cards he sideboarded out, but maybe that's not very impactful. You know, that's a giant flaw in my game. I probably would have scooped there as well. Okay. Uh, I think like. Uh, when you feel like you're beat, um, you know, maybe you're flustered and you want to get it over with as fast as possible. Uh, I learned from Brian Hacker years ago uh, to scoop to save uh, decision-making ability, right? So um, here's a question. How much is it... it so your, your combo deck with Dress and Cabal Therapy, which gives a lot of information local to the decisions that you're making as opposed to strategic decisions, how much value are you getting about whether or not the opponent has Russian River versus just taking a breath, getting away from... Like, all right, I'm in a bad situation. I just want to get to the next game. So I I will definitely agree that there's not a lot to gain. I I will counter that, but I feel like things do not phase me very well. Like, I like I don't get upset. Like, it, like to me, the, I guess the, the gain is not there, but the downside to me is not also not there. Probably the biggest argument is it takes a little bit longer and my time is probably better served just moving on. That's probably the best argument, but I don't know. I... I know, I think in my sense, I would have made him flip some cards, so. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, so from our standpoint where we're not in the game, I think that you definitely, you're probably right, right? In the abstract, we're robots playing robot magic instead of humans playing an emotional game of magic, you're probably right. Uh, I think I would flatter myself and say the same thing, but I know <laughs> that the last big tournament I played in, which was the North American Pre-Modern Championship, I was like mad when a Hall of Famer told me it was a long day and like people make mistakes at the end of the day. And then I played bad the last turn that I had a decision against Flint, right? Like, I kept a hand that wasn't going to win, right? And, you know, because... And then he just killed me real quick. Mm -hmm. So, I think if there is a flaw here, I think both Tom and Connor are shuffling too quickly. <laughs> I, I, I think Tom passed real fast on that one, and I would have mixed my deck more. All right. I'm, like, crazy fastidious about shuffling, though. All right, so... Players have... It looks like so Tom has kept if he's and it, it looks like Connor is thinking about his hand. Do you think Connor sided Oath of Druids back in? It's interesting. Um he took a while longer to pass than Tom did. And uh clearly Oath of Druids would have text if your opponent did not sideboard out he clearly did not sideboard the welders back out of his deck. Mm -hmm. That means there's welders in his deck. Um uh, in a matchup between Oath of Druid and Welder, as much as I respect the Welder, I think Oath of Druids takes that matchup. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think. I guess I, I did, I'm trying to think of the sideboard that he had. Like, I think probably the Oath of Druids are worth, because I don't think there's... I'm, I'm going to jump back to the decks real quick. Let's see what he'd be bringing in. I mean, I it's powder. It's, it's powder kegs that we saw. So you're okay with like just putting in a, a seven seven? I don't. I don't think that plan is good enough. Like I don't. So I would have. I, listen to this. I would have symbiotic worm in my deck, and I would take out a bunch of the combo pieces. So uh, Tom's deck is currently optimized to fight against Connor's uh, Connor's combo, including cards like Tormod's Crypt. How much value do you think uh, Connor puts into a hand that has a Tormod's Crypt? And if you take away the value of the Tormod's Crypt, and you know he's playing Welder. You don't think a 7-7 seven, seven that is highly synergistic with Cabal Therapy is good? I think it's fantastic. He's literally going to put him in a situation where he probably can't win if that card comes up. The problem I feel like is, like, if if Connor is going into, my plan is get a 7-7 seven, seven and then attack you three times. But that's not his plan. His plan is, so every single game has started the same way, which is Connor slowing down Tom's combo kill with Duress and Cabal Therapy, Right. And the reason that Connor hasn't won all of those games is because Tom has won before Connor could win. Uh, Symbiotic Worm is not a 7-7. It's like a 13-13, right? 
right? So the first one is a 7-7, but then you sacrifice this Cabal Therapy, you get a bunch of bodies, and then you animate dead it again, because that's what Connor's deck does. Like, that's a two-turn clock. That is, right? that is fair to Every single okay. game has gone an additional two turns minimum as a result of Dress and Cabal Therapy. Connor's problem is that Tom can win in the interim turns. He's actually taking that away, and I think you could totally steal a game that way, uh, because you know that there's Goblin Welder. Now, if you are really confident, if Connor thinks on the play in this game that he can win a fair one, where he's just like, all right, well, I, I'm confident in my combo. I'm going to be robust. I, I won the last time I was on the play. I'm going to take this one fair. I have to break serve. I'm telling you, if I'm going to game five, Symbiotic Wormen with the Druids are in my deck if I'm Connor. Yeah, I can see that. Like, and, right and, now, and then, 100%. Then I think I'd be bringing in like the Stronghold Gambits, and you're just hoping he doesn't have a Goblin Welder when you reveal a Symbiotic Worm. I think that's that's very reasonable. Like it, it, every every game so far has been won by the player on the play. So Connor has to be thinking about how we can how we can break the serve in game five if that's the case. And I think Oath of Druids against Goblin Welder is a matchup that I would love to be the Oath of Druids player in. Uh, and if your opponent is playing Tormod's Crypt and he thinks that's one of the best cards, uh, which he has no reason not to think that right now, play in such a way that it's not one of the best cards. Uh, I can almost guarantee you that. Um, that that he would be able to win if he did the Dureska Ball Therapy open into Oath of Druids. All right, Dress on the first turn yet again. This time, is that a gold bordered underground river? Yeah, it does look that way. Yes. Is that like a Carlos Ramau underground? No, because that one would be a seventh edition. This would probably be. I'm trying to think which. I... Chat, help me out. Which which world championship deck would this be coming from i cannot think how do you feel about alter dementia versus fling there i, I agree with that yeah i uh, uh, so alter dementia is better because you can spend your two mana like a down payment and and put, put it into play and then then like tinker well, or just cast a infinite bomber. life is a prophylactic against the fling combo, that's also right? true yeah well whereas it's not against the alter dementia combo which we saw in game one all right uh chromatic in play, Shivan Reef. Land follow up is going to be. Is that second guessing it? Is that island? Yes, there, I think there's one natural island, I think, in the. If I were the kind of person with a black bordered city of brass in my deck, there's no way that's the island that's in my deck. I'm that's, telling you right now. That's a nice it's island. Not that island. That's a nice that's island. island. It's not an island. That island's like five cents. <laughs> Zero percent chance that's the island. All right, so there's a gatekeeper and an alter dementia in play, thanks to Lotus Petal. In the immortal words of Zv Mashwitz banned Lotus Petal. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm trying to think what the likelihood of Connor if he tries to go. So he always has a sack outlet because of alter. He and, can't go off at instant speed though, right? No, but he can always rebuy a gamekeeper into a new gamekeeper. And then he will, he, so he can definitely hit the Bailiff, and he has two Lotus Petals. I think he just wins here. Because he'll be able to get two mana back. Oh, Lo because there's two Lotus Petals. Yes, already. and then, so he, he'd be able to mill. Yeah, I think this is definitive, I think. I, I might have said that, like, the other matches that, that has happened. Yeah, but this time he started with two Lotus Petals. Yes, so. All right, so here we go. Chat is saying that that island is $70. How is that island seventy dollars? I think it's an APAC one. Oh, okay. Uh, please apologize to the chat for <laughs> me uh, of my ignorance. Uh, I guess it's a good island. I I will be figuring trying to figure out what that uh, gold bordered. Is were any of like the Pro Tour one decks? Did those have or those didn't have Ice Age yet? Did Underground it? River did... was not good at Pro Tour one. Okay. Well, that was an Adarkar Waste, and as embarrassing as it should be for everyone, Brushland. <laughs> There were a lot of brushlands in that top. I mean, Armageddon's pretty powerful, so. I mean, let's be honest, dude. How many Necrodex were in that top eight? I think I just mean, one. Ex yeah, and it wasn't very good. <laughs> uh, Team Pacific Coast Legends had Underground River in their Pro Tour 1 deck. However, none of them made top eight. Because it was a home decap tournament, they had Recall in their sideboard. Oh, okay. Along with Jalem Tome. How many people who could you have had on, on a commentary with you who would know those factors? 
debates about Protor 1.8 and non dot debate decks. Uh, not many. <laughs> not anyone that I can name. It's me and George Baxter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, exciting stuff has happened to the point that the game is now over. Okay. Um, Tom has uh, resituated himself for game five. Uh, so far, the player who's gone first has won every single game. Uh, this is undoing my entire concept of the pre-modern format. Uh, I've been advertising this as the best format for everyone to play because play draw doesn't matter. <laughs> Connor Abbott Brown and Tom Matelski are doing their best to render me a liar. <laughs> what I would like is some Oath of Druids and some Symbiotic Worms out of Connor's deck so he can break serve. Otherwise, I predict player going first is going to win game five, just like that player won games one, two, three, and four. Despite... Connor going off in two of those games and not winning. Was that a turn two or turn three kill? Uh, I think that was a turn... It was like, yeah, it's turn two kill, right? So, no, no, no. Alter was on turn two. Uh, okay. Gamekeeper was on okay. turn three with okay. Double Lotus. Yeah. It was not a turn two kill. It's like first turn duress for Alter, second turn Alter myself, third turn Lotus Lotus Gamekeeper. Got ya. So who do you like in this game three? We've seen it like the decks kind Tom. of. You, so Tom, just it's just because of the play. Like the player on the play has won every okay. game so far, including games where where Connor's gone off. Yep. I when I looked at the decks in paper, I put a lot of value in. <laughs> you're gonna laugh at and the cards like Cabal Therapy and Duress that that would buy uh, Connor enough time so that he'd be able to combo. And that, I didn't feel like Tom had that much disruption. Uh, so Cabal but, Therapy and duress are probably at their best in decks like connor's which can win the, like, very quickly right so but i think that like, one of the reasons i don't like the rock at all is that like it's this deck that has an answer to every question except the question it should have answered to begin with which was should i have played the rock <laughs> and the reason for that is like you disrupt your opponent into nothing blow up all their stuff with pernicious deed and then your best case scenario is you put them on a three turn clock that's if you have your fastest clock of deranged tournament. They get three turns. That's only nine power. Nine power times nine power is eighteen. You you literally give them an additional initial turn if you pay the if you pay the echo. All right. Uh, alternate clocks are like four or five turns, depending on if you're a Bla blaster. Doesn't even win the game by itself, which is humiliating. All right. So, um, and in this format, if you're playing against combo decks, or even if you're playing against a psychotog deck deck that can reset the battlefield with an upheaval. There's all kinds of... People with Wrath of Gods can turn the game around. You just give them a lot of time to come back. And uh, you can certainly render your opponent to no cards in hand, and they can just top deck and kill you if they're playing a combo deck. That's a tale as old as time. Like, first time I cast a Duress on the Pro Tour, my opponent top decked me into a Spirit of the Night and killed me the next turn. Right? So, it's... Uh, it's not the worst. It's actually at near its best, I think, in Connor's deck. But Dress and Cabal Therapy are not what um, I would be favoring. Uh, although Tom doesn't have a lot of interplay, right? So I like to play cards like Factor Fiction if I think people are going to play Dress and Cabal Therapy. He gets one Factor Fiction, and they feel pretty, pretty <laughs> yeah. powerless, right? Like It undoes a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you ever flip five, five uh, spells with a Factor Fiction? I don't know I mean, if the, I ever have. The, the duress dude does not feel real, <laughs> real confident the first time there's a five spell foff. Four spell foffs are almost worse because they guarantee two lands. I'm sorry, two spells in a land. That does not feel good. Yeah. But nobody ever comes back from a five, five spell <laughs> foff. <laughs> not if the other guy is a duress deck. Yes. So one thing to note, um, I think if Connor is presented his deck, it just the, the timing, it didn't seem like he went back. Kind of no, to no, the to does, the sideboard, so he does not have symbiotic room in his nope. deck right now. But, but wouldn't it be exciting if he did? I think it's reasonable. I like to try and to go for that route. Um, it, yeah, it would be definitely very exciting for Stronghold Gambit or Oath of Druids to bring a symbiotic worm. So the reason that I think it's so good is because he needs so a he can reliably play as though Oath of Druids is good. Tom ha clearly has Goblin Welder in his deck right now, right? Tom is just going to put out Goblin Welder if he can cast it. This isn't a creature removal matchup, right? So because of that, uh, Connor, Connor knows that Oath of Druids will be good if he draws it, right? Secondly, 
he needs to do something to disrupt the play draw pattern because, I mean, maybe Tom will mul- – let's say Tom double mulligans to five and Connor kept, like, Jureska ball therapy. Maybe Tom just loses on the merits then. Mm-hmm. That's entirely possible, right? Like, I, I know from recent personal experience that you keep a careful study squee hand, and you're like, this is a pretty good five-card <laughs> hand. And then Flint Espel just duresses your careful study, and now you have Squire. In yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. That, that, so, you know, Jureska ball therapy is pretty good when your opponent mulligans a lot. That's yeah. fair. But no, I don't, I don't put a lot of stock in it. I put a lot of stock in the, the faster combo deck. All right, Tom has shift back one hand. I think that was the first time he mulliganed. And so I don't know if he was thinking about that hand for a long time, but it seemed like he was holding his cards for a while. I mean, what do you think about? Do you think about, like, hey, how fast is this hand in the goldfish? Or do you think about how disruptable is this hand knowing your opponent is a dress ball therapy deck? It's Go all- in at least to five here. Discard spells are always on my mind. I mean, they're against decks that I can play. But, I mean, sometimes you can't, you can't do anything about it. Like, it... Like what are you, are you gonna throw away a perfectly good hand because it's bad against Cabal Therapy? I don't think you. Can I don't do actually that. factor discard into my okay. into my hand keep uh, uh, discussions. There was a Twitter discussion precipitated by Ali Antrazi this week that Brian Kowal actually was a big uh, kind of proponent into, along with uh, with Matt Sperling, and I, I kind of chimed in where Ali Antrazi was like, "Why is Thoughtseize?" A card that people are allowed to play and he just named other cards that people are not allowed to play like bale of summer for example so certain cards are too good at one and uh koal was like yeah making somebody mulligan their best card is is toxic right i'm just like i think that my win rate is higher when my opponent casts thought season if they don't <laughs> cast thought season the abstract like <laughs> it's just, it's just a foreign concept to me <laughs> like <laughs> like like really? They just did two damage to themselves. That's like half a card, <laughs> and they use their turn. All my cards do the same thing. Like, what do I care? I mean, it, it's very contextual in terms of what what you're playing against or what the opponent is doing. But I, I mean, I feel like I think I think Ali had used saying like duress is the card that he would feel is is good because it it stops the broken decks. He would say, but allows people. Like to have that counterplay, but I, I mean, just to be like, try to like have a window into somebody's mind. Ali in particular likes engine-based combo decks, and engine-based combo decks versus redundancy-based combo decks are very differently uh, vulnerable to individual discard, right? So maybe they spoil his fun. Speaking of spoiling fun, there is a fifth, uh, fifth consecutive first turn duress. All right, and, and we see. <laughs> An Impulse. island, a, a lovely island. Let's a let's seventy dollar island, <laughs> according to chat. Uh, Impulse and Mindstone. So Impulse goes to the graveyard. Mindstone will come onto the battlefield, and then there's one unknown card in Tom. So the five card, five card Mulligan down to five cards. He's got nearly everything in play now. No idea what's in Connor's hand, but I I have the advantage bar all the way to uh, all the way to Team Gamekeeper right now. <laughs> Yeah, because at this point, Tom is both at the mercy of what's on the top of his deck and what's in Connor's deck. Like, he both has to fade Connor not killing him and then kind of run together a string of luck to to put the combo together from his perspective. So, yeah, things do not look good. Four of the five cards he has access to in this game are in play right now, and none of them are going to win the game. So, (laughs) I think that... uh... Well, Connor's advantage bar is is dwindling in my imaginary uh, kind of Cartesian plane here, uh, just because he hasn't taken an action yet. Uh, also, his gold border in City of Brass is like in the middle of his play mat. That's like a power move. Oh, <laughs> Alter Dementia. What do we got here? Oh, see another third turn kill? Yeah. <sighs> Maybe the right way to build Connor's deck is with like all City of Brass and uh, Ancient Tombs instead of Sappers and Scaries and Gemstone Mines. It seems like he's doing way better in the games that his lands don't blow themselves up uh, than in the games where uh, he's not taking a lot of damage from his hand. I think he has four City of Brass. I don't know how many Ancient Tombs he has. What I'm saying is I would like to build the deck in such a way that you don't draw any of the lands that blow themselves up. Uh, You'd rather just draw the lands that... What is that? Another discard spell? Mm-hmm. What are you naming here? Just in the dark? I don't know. I don't think it would I be Mindstone. Name Mindstone. <laughs> I wouldn't have named that for sure. Uh, I probably would have named like Flinger Devourer, I think. Mm-hmm. 
Tinker maybe. But he doesn't have four intuitions, right? So I said they Tim, Tinker Devourer or Fling. I would have named it for a not a non vital artifact that he already has a copy of in play. Uh, but he, you know, the coast is relatively clear. Like he knows that there's no uh, spoiler card in Tom's hand. If he has the combo, he can go for it immediately. So we have someone in chat asking how the Turtle Splash deck wins. Uh, I'll briefly say it it loops things with Surprise and Bailiff. But uh, if it does come to into play again, we will elaborate on what it's trying to do. But uh, it's basically a, a uh, it tries to loop uh, a combo and mill out the opponent. So if it can generate a certain amount of mana, north of two, right? Two mana is uh, the amount that it costs to cast a Dance of the Dead or an Animate Dead. It can, it can both be infinite and take future actions, right? If there is uh, an Alter Dementia already in play, two is enough. Is that correct? Yeah, when we say two mana, like two mana in terms of cards like Lotus Petal. Or, yeah, Lotus Petal. Yes, or if you get started with like a Lion's Eye Demon, then yes. Um, if if Claws of Gix is the the sack outlet, then it requires an additional mana each time, because that costs one to sacrifice. But that's also a quasi kill, like not in this matchup. Uh, generally speaking, because we saw that in I believe game one, mm -hmm. where Connor was able to generate a, call it a trillion life points, and he still lost to the Devourer combo, utilizing uh, uh, Alter of Dementia to uh, destroy his, his library. All right, uh, Tom has sacrificed Chromatic Sphere to draw a card. Uh, and the card was Tormod's Crypt. Oh, will it be a game? Last time we saw Tormod's Crypt, it won the game immediately. How much time does this buy Tom? Oh, well, there's a powder keg. Zero turns. <laughs> zero turns. <laughs> exactly zero, zero turns. turns. <laughs> there is no Goblin Welder to, uh, to bring that Tormod's Crypt back right now. When I when I do my like kind of fundamental turn math, uh, typically I will count any interplay, like a duress cabal therapy counter spell uh, that's successful in resolving or torment script by plus one turn against the opponent. Um, I just kind of have the assumption they have to take one more turn to to draw another piece. Uh, in this case, it's zero turns because a uh, powder keg will answer it immediately. It answer it before it can actually do any damage. Uh, the sum total of what this can do right now is keep Connor from flashing back to cabal therapy. All right, double mindstone. So he's actually baiting Connor. He's like, "Hey, Connor, if you, get, <laughs> if you get that powder keg to two, you can get two mindstones." Oh, he's he's second one right away. So he lied. Yes, I the, lied. The drew a card. The carrot that was dangled has been taken away. He just he second guessed himself. <laughs> so deceptively, Connor's actually going to have to kind of win the game here, right? Because uh, there's two cards in Tom's hand, and at any time, like if one of those cards is a fling or a uh, altar of dementia, Tom is about one mana from winning the game right now. Yes. So if he had, if he drew a card and had Tinker and Fling and had an access to a fifth mana, then yes, he would have everything he would need. Do you? So, I mean, obviously Tom's start was not very good, and I don't know if. <laughs> Like Connor, like would Connor play more? Could he be more passive, or do, do you think that's not the right approach? If, I, with I, with Tom having three cards in his hand, I have no idea what's in Connor's hand, but it seems to me that Connor kept a hand that doesn't win the game, and that he overvalued the fact that he had duress and cabal therapy against a player who had mulligan to five. And this is, in my opinion, this is like a, a potentially an example of a classic trap where you overvalue the duress cabal therapy hands and then you don't actually win the game and your opponent has time to recover. Now, Connor could easily render me a liar by going off the next turn, right? But he hasn't done anything for the last two or three turns, despite the fact that he reduced Tom to, you know, no advantage bar by turn three, right? Right. And I, I think right now, either player can win. Um, I think like, if you just look at, look, okay, is there an altar in play right now? There is. So Tom is like literally a tinker. Okay, a, a jewel. That, and so uh, let's just count the regular mana here. So there is, is there a mind stone still? Yeah. So yeah. one, two, three, four, five. He's like one mana or one uh, or one tinker away from winning the game on the spot here. And I actually think Connor has to have a duplicate copy of the combo in his hand right now, or he's already lost the game. 
it, it can't just be a mana. He needs to also have Devourer. When I say a mana, I mean, like, this is pretty close. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like, it's so... definitely... We talked about that Tom wasn't doing anything or his board was bad. It looks a lot better right now. <laughs> I would be a little nervous if I were in Connor's seat. So what I mean by a mana is it's actually... I actually think it's it's worse than that, right? If he has a sixth mana, he can just intuition into the kill. I will also note that Jeweled Amulet's mana cost is zero, and Tom or Connor does have a powder keg in play, so I guess there is a little bit of counterplay in that aspect. If he wants to use the powder keg to deny, he would have to do it before he Tom untaps to deny him that mana. In but. my opinion. Connor has to win the game in the next two turns. Okay. Right? And if he doesn't, the wind because his he can't disrupt Tom's combo once Tom's already going off. Right? He can disrupt Tom's combo by stopping it from from being assembled to begin with. Okay, Jewel Amulet. Is it powering up? It's the blue mana has been added. That's like a $70 blue mana, too. <laughs> All right, yeah, so getting the, him for a cabal therapy. The powder keg is going to be used, and then Tom will um, use the the Tormod script before it goes to the graveyard. And now we're at a spot where Tinker is what Tom needs. Tinker, Intuition are very good cards. Uh, what can Tom use to disrupt Connor in the middle of his combo? Tormod script, R rushing river. Sometimes rushing river. I don't like that. It's just super situational to me. What do you do? Like bounce and animate dead target? Uh, it's awful. Or maybe alter of dementia in certain situations. But yeah, it's... If, if if they have a fake amount of mana that they're generating, that's just not going to save you. Uh, Jeweled Amulet is one of the worst possible draws. Uh, he drew it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's in this situation, it's basically a land, a land that it's like one of those really bad lands that like only. A, like, when you tap it for mana, it doesn't untap the next turn. Would have rather had yeah. a land. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Why do they play Jeweled Amulet instead of Lotus Petal? Uh, you can sack it to Tinker. You can't sacrifice Lotus Petal to Tinker? Well, you, I mean, you can tap the Jeweled Amulet for mana and then sack it for... And sacrifice the yeah, Tinker. I think that's the idea. There's, like, two copies, I think, is usually the, the standard for that card. Yeah, I think I'd rather just have a Lotus Petal. All right, what card are you naming? Intuition? Yeah, if there was Tinker, he'd already have cast it. Yeah. I, I actually yeah. Think or Devourer. It, I think he doesn't have anything. Yeah. So this is just clearing the path. So I think that Connor might just win here, right? But I Tom doesn't have anything. Like, the, the best card to name is, like, Impulse. Okay. Well, I mean... All right. I, th I, I, might, name, like, I might name Intuition. He, you, if he's going to... If he has Intuition, he's... I don't know, man. Do you think he's just going to let you name it? Well, uh, if, if... Assuming that Connor is passing the turn... I mean, like, that would be the worst case scenario, right? Well, it looks like Tom has an impulse, uh, an intuition, rather. Uh, so I think it seems like he just missed. Is that what happened, or is that it's on the it's on the stack still? Yeah, he's oh, he's waiting he's saying, to respond. The cabal therapy has not resolved. Is he executing oh, some table game here? Oh, Connor is targeting himself with oh, cabal therapy. Oh, okay. So he named Gamekeeper. And he's going to animate dead that. Okay. And yes, because his hand is Lion's Eye Diamond, and then two Dance of the Dead and animate dead. So, Connor is saying, I can mill you out next turn. Okay. So, Tom has to sacrifice his Mind Stone right now to try to get some material. Uh, and this might be a situation where Jewel Amulet is, in fact, better than, Lions, uh, than Lotus Petal. Because if he draws Tinker, it's going to be able to complete the combo. Actually, Lotus Petal would in this situation also. Yeah. No dice for for uh, for Jeweled Amulets. <laughs> Zero Jeweled Amulet dice. Okay, Impulse. What do we got? Uh, that Impulse, if it gets a Tinker, makes Jeweled Amulet good. It needs to be, I think it needs to be Tormod Crypt, I think is the card that he needs. The, right, the last one. the game. Tinker, he needs another mana. Oh, I mean, presuming he has yep. a hand. Uh, it can be... I mean, it can just be Rushing River, right? You can respond to... You can respond to uh, 
the anime dead by rushing river and the altar of dementia there is a cabal therapy uh it it's possible that would be enough it's also possible that connor could still win through that all right we do have an ancient tomb good card yes it's a good card but that's like 55 dollars yeah. i don't know <laughs> but yeah but with with tom's demeanor and him passing the turn i unless there is a card like rushing rubber i i think connor has it so two lines eye diamonds uh, I think the second one is not needed, but why don't people just play like one guy as blessing in their sideboard? Uh, for like for these types of situations, yeah, like you just don't lose. Yeah, um, I think if these decks become more prominent, I think that is very reasonable. Um, better or worse than one Eason Shade? <laughs> uh, better. <laughs> I don't. I don't know how well the Eason Shade did. I mean, it's some style points it's i think i mean but i have summoned some eastern shade in my day and i don't think i would use the sideboard slot on one in pre-modern in 2022 okay uh dance of the dead targeting presumably gamekeeper uh it's gonna be game if this happens right yeah so okay we'll talk about what's looping so the, the dance of the dead is an enchantment that brings the gamekeeper back when the gamekeeper dies he's going to get a new creature it's either going to be a gamekeeper or the surprise and bailiff eventually he's going to find surprise and bailiff and when so he's the... utilizing uh cabal therapy as the okay as the start things off rather yeah rather than uh rather than um alter of dementia okay and that's the bailiff uh, yes. What's what do we got in the so in response to the bailiff trigger? What's he going to do? Like sacrifice both lion's eyes diamonds? Yes, and so that will give him mana, and then he will be able to sacrifice his bailiff and get all the artifacts and enchantments back. He'll be able to cast an animate dead to bring back the bailiff, and because he's netting mana um, during that loop, he'll be able to do that as much as he wants. The altar of dementia will be able to mill cards off the top of Tom's deck, and he's just able to pass the turn and win. So, the poor cabal therapy never even resolved. <laughs> oh, this is still on the stack. <laughs> okay, uh, Tom's like, when do I get to reveal my card in hand? You let me know. <laughs> Yes, because so... at this point, yep, Connor's saying, I will I will do this loop and mill you out. And Tom shows a hand of fling and alter of dementia. Those cards don't interact with what Connor's trying to do. And I think that leaves us with a spring fling champion of Connor Abbott Brown and his turtle splash deck. Was able to break serve and uh and and take the match. So I could not be happier. This validates my position that play draw doesn't matter in pre-modern, even if he did it the wrong way. Now, obviously, if it had been, uh, you know, some symbiotic worm beatdown, that would have been preferable. What if the Eson Shade was in play, you know, in the red zone on the last turn? That would have been the best. Now, we saw an inferior way of winning, but uh, still validating the greatness of pre-modern as a format. Play draw didn't matter, despite the fact that these are two decks that can win inside of the third turn no matter what. All right, I'm going to jump over to the players. I'm going to unmute them. We will see if maybe they have some insight of the game or sideboarding, and then we'll kind of Correct fill in. Thought. Did you bring in the Rushing Rivers, even? No, no. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bluffing a card that's not even in my set. Yeah, that's great. That was that was really, really well done. The... Yeah, because I was like there. open deck list. So he might think I have Rushing River here. I was like, let me just let me pretend I have it. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> I still had to go for it no matter what there. But... Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I don't think you could wait a turn because I could be holding like a Devourer there and I have the mana. So you're like, uh, it just seemed right. possible. That's what I had in my hand. Yep. Connor, I ask you a question. It's Michael. All right, well, I actually need to flip my camera around so that we they, can. They might still have us muted. They probably want to talk to us, right? So let me Definitely. Just yeah. A second.
players, can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm still unmuting the other Michael. There we go. All right. Okay. Well, congratulations, Connor. Uh, Thank you. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I, Mike, I, did you have something that you wanted to ask right away? Yeah, I had a question. So I was just thinking, uh, Connor, uh, mm -hmm. at least going into game five, maybe not maybe not game four situation, mm -hmm. do you think about bringing Oath of Druids back into your deck and perhaps uh, also uh, Symbiotic Worm? And the reason I ask that is mm -hmm. Tom was clearly playing in a way with Goblin Welder that uh, Oath of Druids might have had text. And, um, That's true. And it, it seemed to me, it, this actually played out in game five. You just, for whatever reason... Tom got, you know, redundant copies of the wrong side of his combo uh, late yeah, in the right. game, right? He got more kill cards and no devourer, no tinker, where yeah. mm -hmm. you were ahead. Every single game, you were ahead with gold-bordered City of Brass into Duress, right? <laughs> got a bunch of time. Right, yeah. And then, but you didn't always win, right? Like, you got, like, two or three That's turns. True. I was yeah. just like, like, maybe, like, Hoip is, like, a 7-7's seven, seven not good there. And I'm like, well, isn't it, right? Like, he has all these all this time, but it's not even a 7-7. Seven, seven. You can follow up with the Gaval therapy, and it's like thirteen right, hour true. the next mm -hmm. turn, right? So I was well, thinking like you, that you, was a potential you lose route. The, you lose the worm in that case, right? But you buy the worm back. Oh, if you have like reanimation, yeah, that's yeah, true. It, I mean, you're doing mm -hmm. stuff like reanimating Goblin Welder or like beating down right. his Devourer. <laughs> it, uh, a shortage of animate deads was never your problem. It didn't seem like it this this time around, but <laughs> you know, I thought about bringing in the worms and whatnot, but I honestly, in testing, I didn't find myself disruptive enough to consistently be able to sit there for three turns attacking with a worm. And I did think a lot about the Goblin Welder Tormod's Crypt interaction uh, post-board, and it's really bad if he gets that online. Like, I'd probably lose, like I did in the one game where that happened. But it's a two-card combo, and he's only playing three welders and two crypts, and I guess Tinker for crypts, potentially, but he probably just kills me if he has Tinker, so... I was thinking it's, you know, if he gets it, he gets it, and I probably lose, but I wanted to be as fast as possible otherwise, and I, yeah, I didn't think, in, in testing, I also didn't find that attacking with 7-7s seven was fast enough. Yeah, it just seemed to me... Thought about you, it, but... Like, at that point, uh, the player who had gone first had won the first four games, yes, and I thought, like... Each of the first four games, yeah. I would have wanted to do something to disrupt the paradigm, but I think... Tom's double mulligan into your fifth consecutive first turn duress was <laughs> was enough. Yeah. yeah. I got lucky to have that, but my plan going into this whole match was I will not keep a hand that doesn't either disrupt him on turn one or me win turn three. That was my mulligan plan. And I stuck with that the entire, all five games, so. Uh, that's Disrupts interesting because that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of, because Tom's basically saying, like, I'm going to try and assemble a... He kind of has to be the aggressor in, the, in this matchup because right. you do have the flexibility of both having the threat of being able to combo out, but then also you do have cards like Cabal Therapy and Duress. Um, so it, yeah. mm -hmm. you know Tom's game plan is going to be much more um, consistent, and you can kind of right. can flex right. in terms of the way you draw the cards. So Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Connor, how many times did you have Isan Shade in your deck over <laughs> the course of the Spring Fling? Unfortunately, just once. So, oh, so Only one time. the line was at... 0.5 and it was above the line <laughs> yeah it might not be i mean it's it's a hedge against the blue white tide control decks and i only faced one of those uh i was thinking but... i especially with your mana base uh i think mm -hmm. maybe one gaia's blessing is better than one one isan shade that's interesting so you bring in gaia's blessing in the matches where you board into the symbiotic worm plan no i mean you won game one and then lost it the next turn Right, so the you you went to infinite life and then Tom milled you out. Well, Gaia's right, blessing so is very problematic if he's trying to combo out. Yeah, it makes my own combo not work because oh. I shuffle all my combo pieces back in. Yeah, that's no fun. All right, don't yeah. do that. That's, that's, <laughs> that seems terrible. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, if if I really wanted to like hedge against this matchup, I don't know. I'm not sure. I think the sideboard would have to be quite different if I wanted to beat t the Tinker deck every time, you know? Yeah, cards that I think are, like, probably something like Engineered Plague or something that... And those are cards that Tom probably played against the entire tournament and was able to beat. Probably, yeah. Because uh, yeah. you're not going to be 
casting a card like null rod in your deck that's not something you want to bring in and uh right nope can't play null rod that's uh, for sure i guess so, you could and if you go to symbiotic worm if you go to that plan you could potentially but i don't know that feels loose to play so for the folks at home, uh, you can name, uh, with, with Engineered Plague, you can put a Devourer deck in a position where they actually can never use the Devourer. Right. right. Like, it, it's it's never actually live as a card. If you have Dance of the Dead, then maybe it could die and you could bring it back and then it would be a 1-1. One, one. But that's only from your side. <laughs> yes. <of> yeah. <laughs> that's not from. That's not from the actual Devourer. Players. Maybe we're evolving the the, oh, this the Tinker deck. The format is, is now taking its first turn 10 years in. <laughs> I was really hoping game one, because I was able to uh, Dance of the Dead his Devour. I was hoping that I would rip an Altar of Dementia Yes. just kill him with his own combo. Yep. Yeah, we did talk about like that. I felt like I was so yeah. close to living the dream of game one, but it didn't. Uh, that game one was wildly, wildly unpredictable. Yeah. No one would have been like, oh yeah, one of, one, one of these decks is going to beat down the other one right. with its combo piece. I probably game one should have ta- rolled the dice and exiled one more card with the Devour to try to get him hopefully hit a two cost uh, spell and then get him below where you can actually tap his mana. But I had the win in hand. I thought I had the win in hand. I had the gamekeeper in hand when I was attacking and I figured that uh, if I exile one more card, I would get super unlucky and hit the surprise of Bailiff, which would not only mean I couldn't combo the next turn, but I also would, uh, my the Devourer would die before damage, so. Tom, you won game one on two life, correct? Is that? Yeah, yeah I think I yeah. finished with two. Yeah. Yeah, three of the damage was from his own lands. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I should have done it. I should have just hoped I didn't hit Bailiff there and tried to get two more damage in. So, uh, Tom, what was your impression of the matchup? Like, did you feel like you were... Was it 50-50? Is it, is it, do you feel like you're a dog? Like, did you have a, a guess on how you stood for the matchup? Yeah, I felt like uh, what you said earlier is I needed to be the, like, faster combo deck. I kind of definitely felt like that. Um, The duress is definitely hurt, but it was weird. I feel like the games played out in a way I would have never expected. Like, almost (laughs) every single time. Like, Connor and I were mentioning, too, it was like, this it's just so strange, like, what was going on. Like, um, especially game one. That might have been the most weirdest game. Like, maybe the most strange game I ever played. (laughs) Um, And the turn where, like, he went to reanimate my Goblin Welder, and I was like, do I crit myself? Like, Oh, there's weird things going on. Yep. So a lot of really neat interactions that obviously don't come up very often, but it, that's kind of the charm of of magic or pre modern specifically. Of kind of you get these nice little weird situations that are really fun. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I would say definitely honing in more on pre modern. You get some like like just that kind of stuff it was quite interesting. Um, but yeah, it was uh it was close. I would say maybe I, I thought he was like a sixty forty favorite. Okay um because he's also really fast it's not like you know he's so many turns behind um uh, i think the one turn i don't know if it was turn two or turn three kill but game four yeah yeah that was a game with a double yeah. lotus pedal yeah, yeah so mm-hmm. that was yeah. that was a pretty fast kill i actually yeah. thought that you were at the advantage tom because i thought that uh connor's deck at least his path through uh two red decks going into top eight he would not be able mm-hmm. to lean against oath of druids against your deck Typically, right? So the Connor was Oath of Druids grading. It must have been grading against goblins. Oh yeah, yeah. Was, so, Oath of Druids. Oath of Druids won me multiple matches throughout the tournament against you know all the creature decks I faced. So yeah, that card is really strong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one one thing I felt throughout this match, so I only saw Ancient Tomb actually game one. I didn't see it again mm-hmm. game two, three, four, or five. Um, it was the, you really rely on Ancient Tomb for either. The, if it's not turn one, you want it on turn two. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. City of Traders, I had on turn two once, but like, um, I don't think I drew a mana, second mana, the third mana for a while, but not having Ancient Tomb in three out of the five, well, four out of the five is definitely difficult. Um, mm-hmm, for I'm sure. like starting with like a turn one, either pass or a turn one sphere. But uh, the deck mulligan as well, it's just, it was like the hands where I had to keep, like, I don't know. I'm just scrolling the chat. It seems like everyone was uh, definitely throughout the tournament has been very excited to see the turtle splash deck. Um, so there are plenty of supporters of Tom and the Devourer deck as well. Uh, the the breakfast cereals are uh, reigning supreme on in the first and second yeah, place. Go cereals! Yes. Well, <laughs> uh, Devourer 
Devourer deck gain a breakfast cereal name? We have been talking about it. I think I think the people have been trying to um, have it be corn pops. Is I guess is it is it because like a devourer kind of pops if it gets too big, or is it does well, it a devourer lo- looks like a bugle? Uh, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. like you just the bugles upside down. It's called bugles. I say, is that a? Did bugles make a cereal? That <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could put milk on bugles, I guess. No, no, that bugles is def- I mean, I think I'm older than all of you guys. Believe me, bugles was sold in a cardboard box, and you yeah. know, oh yeah, Andy Cap would uh, be perfectly fine with you pouring cow <laughs> cow on. Devara also looks like. Triangles. Oh. Also, I would uh, devour a bugle. I mean, they're delicious. Oh yeah, yeah. I was thinking it was it was like fitting for a corn bugle. harvester, like or like a some farming equipment that would like scoop up the corn. That's what I was thinking. But people people have also talked about calling it onigiri shoot because of the little like rice. Oh, yeah. thing. Yeah, this is it America. does look like that too. Uh, there was Phil Wynn, I think, that brought that up. Yeah, yeah, Phil Wynn brought it up. I think it was called that in a. A tournament result I, I assume in japan as well someone named it that there and that, there's a little moment where there's a debate between corn pops and onigiri <laughs> sheep right. uh well i don't really have anything to add i just would like to thank uh, both you players and congratulate you on on a job well done congratulations connor on taking down the spring fling especially with turtle Thanks. splash uh i know um i am very curious to see if other people will start picking up this deck because i certainly was impressed with uh the speed resiliency and the today i think today you showed a little bit of of wear in terms of the consistency like there was one game i think oh, you yeah. hit the bail off really early but um in general uh, the deck is a lot more consistent than i think i gave it credit for so so congratulations yeah, props awesome. to you yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah thank you michael was there anything you wanted to ask the players before we let them go I mean, I go with no. Uh, <laughs> thanks for letting me watch. Yeah, yeah. The, the games were really great. So, um, thank you both players. That was it was a lot of fun. Thanks for being here. Is there anything else you guys want to add before um, you guys leave us? Love the pre-modern community, and it's just I can't wait to play more events with everybody. All right. Tom, do you want to say anything? I'll second that. Yeah, just the community and like the gameplay. It's just. I don't know how anybody can choose any other format over pre-modern. It's like unbelievable. Um, and it's so much fun. And like I said, the, the community adds to that aspect. So, um, Tom, what were you playing before you joined? And when did you join pre-modern and when did you come to that conclusion? That's a great question. That's, I think three years ago I joined and um, I was actually like a moto grinder uh, with like legacy vintage. Um, and I actually kind of were talking about, I got fed up after war of the spark like i kept trying and like playing you know it's just it just i stopped having fun and uh yeah i i just like quit and i went like a rant sort of on twitter about it um so i just joined the pre-modern community in the last 12 months right so uh i mean i still play a lot of magic gathering arena but it was you know going to lobster con and and playing and you guys validated that actually in this match. I, I've been telling people the reason I like pre modern so much is that play draw doesn't matter. And then whoever went first won the first four games. And I'm like, well. <laughs> uh, but then when Connor broke serve, I'm like, that ah, validates my position on pre modern. Exactly. Uh, but I, I think that I come from the same place as you, Tom, which is that I still love contemporary magic, but I feel like play draw is so heavily dictating who wins in contemporary magic right now and all of the value is in the cards versus you have a format like this where as far as i can tell connor is like the innovator of this particular deck took this deck brought it in stormed all the way to the finals and then won it right it's like a kind of an echo of like what flint did a few weeks ago at lobster con and it seems amazing to me that there's a format that's been around with a static number of sets, been around for 10 years, and people can still build new decks and show off what you can do and win on the draw and whatever else. Uh, and I I would, I don't say, you know, you can't play any other formats, although I, mean, I literally didn't log into Arena for nine days after, <laughs> after I played two days of pre-modern. But, I mean, it's so good, and I think... I, I just want to share it with people because uh, a lot of my friends, followers, etc., who I've been 
make and listen to me about pre-modern for the last couple of weeks are all kind of becoming pre-modern adoptees. And I, I feel like people have the same sentiment that you have, Tom. And I, I have the same sentiment as you, which is why I asked the question. Yeah, that and you add in the nostalgia, right? So you, see, you said you played back then. I started when I was a kid in Saga. And like the just the feeling of going back, it can like bring you back in time. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. So I don't want to admit that that's true because there's a lot of players who came since after Scourge, right? For sake of argument. So they don't have the same level of nostalgia. Yeah. But I was thinking about it in the shower while I was getting ready to, to do this. I'm like, hold on a second. This is fourth edition to Scourge. This literally echoes the start of my first pro career and the birth of my first child, like that window. And then I just didn't play on. And once I had my second kid, I didn't play on the pro tour for 10 years. But like, I'm like, oh, man, I don't want this to be about nostalgia. But it kind of. <laughs> <laughs> what am I gonna lie? Yeah. I really <laughs> like casting a jackal pup. Right? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I will let you players go. I uh, again, just uh, thanks for a great tournament and thanks for making this finals really special. But um, Mike and I are gonna wrap things up, and uh, but right. we'll let you guys go. Enjoy your thanks, guys. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks so much. Awesome job, both of you. Thank you. Yep, thank you so much. Okay, so as we wrap up the stream, we have crowned Connor as the champion of the 2022 Spring Fling with none other than the Turtle Splash deck. Uh, so congratulations to him. Thank you, everyone who's able to to watch and tune in and um, chat with us and enjoy this match. I do want to thank you, Michael, for, for joining us in the booth. Uh, I was very excited. I don't know how many times I can tell you this, but it, it, it never ceases to be true. I'm very excited for you to be uh, on screen with me and uh, talking about pre-modern. It is, it, I have a, a I mean, huge grin on my, my face. It's my favorite so. format. And I'm a huge fan of the work that you've been doing. Okay. I told you, uh, in order to gear up for LobsterCon, I watched a lot of Cloud Goat Ranger. And it's funny. You're just like, oh, watch this. And I'm like, there's some stuff that I hadn't discovered yet, right? I was like, Maybe I'm just like a neophyte at using the internet. <laughs> just click the things that YouTube put in front of me. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know uh, what everybody else's experience is, but I actually started watching uh, Michael Hood videos as a result of my friend Brian Kowal telling me uh, that he was streaming the Misty Mountain Tournament, right? And so I put a lot of extra weight in the Misty Mountain Tournament in my preparation, um, I think as a result of recency. And it also felt like a big tournament to me relative to some of the results I had encountered uh in pre-modern globally uh but it also was kind of bad in the sense that it just reinforced the idea that red was the best deck to me <laughs> right? so, red was the best set coming in red won that tournament i'm trying to get people to try to play browbeat instead of ball lightning <laughs> funny so i don't know man what do you think is the best deck in pre-modern is it rouge elephant no. is it bounty of the hunt it is it is not <laughs> um the best deck i think it's I it's think, gotta be Devourer a combo, right? I was gonna say Survival Elves. I think it's still. I think Survival Elves. I mean, I thought Survival Elves was the best deck six months ago, right? When I first started, you know, looking at the format. But uh, it, it depends, man. Like you literally need three takebacks a game, five <laughs> takebacks a game if you're a mortal man, right? That deck has a lot of bookkeeping, and you know, it's it's an origami piece like mm -hmm. every every aspect of that deck is very narrowly balanced on the other aspects of the deck and if everything goes right you're the fastest most powerful deck but you don't even have a combo kill really right i mean i guess you kind of do yeah you're if just, you like, you kind of overwhelmingly do. advantaged yeah why don't people play cards like rafellos and plow under like why i at least sideboard those cards i do not know i feel like rafellos definitely could have a home I guess the problem is, is like the cards are super clunky if you're not drawing Rafellos, but I don't know if you just have like Ancient Tombs or City of Traders or something, you probably could make something work, though. That's a little bit awkward with Rafellos, but... With Rafellos? I, 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 like, I look at a lot of those things, like the major innovation in Survival Elves is just adding Wall of Blossoms, right? Like that was the big thing. Well, the Wall of Blossoms is going to turn around our slime. <laughs> I think that, yeah, I think it that's... It doesn't what, really. I think that's what Ole's plan was, and I hadn't... I hadn't seen that until the the LobsterCon tournament. I think was the first time uh, I'd, I'd seen that in place. So here's Michael Flores' uh, suggestion. Uh, this is going to become this is going to become the Bible for survival elves after this. And I know that because I I only found out after his tournament report that Olarade had uh, learned how to play the red matchup from listening to my interview with Brian Manalakos. And I was just like, 
what are you kidding me? Like I just started playing pre-modern, but I, you know, I did a lot of playtesting. I think mm-hmm. uh, more than more than some folks. Uh, I think Lurgoyth is actually the card that you want. Uh, so it's easy to load up. You have high expectation that your guys are going to die. And it, you know, by the time you can play a lure, first of all, you can survival into it. And second of all, by the time you're in the situation where you're like in the mid game, you have four lands. Uh, their ball lightning can't get through it and it kills them really fast. Uh, anger Lurgoyth? Anger a second Lurgoyth? Two Lurgoyths is the way to go. Lurgoyth. Write I, that down. All right. I, I'm not convinced. I will say I'm not sold. You will, you, you try it <laughs> and you'll be like, Oh, I didn't really realize that with anger what Lurgoyth did. Like, their whole game plan is killing all your elves. How many elves do you think you have in the graveyard at the point that your Lurgoyth hits the battlefield? Your first Lurgoyth, just his job is to absorb a ball in. Your second Lurgoyth, you're swinging for, like... Their Lurgoyths get bigger, Michael Horde, right? Like, <laughs> if you just have five land open, that's plus ten, plus ten. That's, your opponent can't live through that. That's that's true. Yeah, it does, it think it does get that one, right? That's true. So uh, I came to this conclusion because uh, I was playing a mono black control deck around 2003 uh, that Kai Buddha made. And people were like, oh, you can't play mono black control on standard because there's this card compost. And I'm like, well, what if we just played in a way that didn't interact, interact with compost? And they're like, well, how do you play a mono black deck that doesn't interact with compost? I'm like, well, what if, what if we don't care how many cards go to the graveyard, right? If you consider an innocent blood and you compare it to an unsummon, right? An unsummon is a good card against beatdown. Right, a compost just basically turns an, in, an innocent blood into a, an unsummon. It is only if we decide to agree with them that their compost matters that your compost actually matters. What if we play on a different axis? And so I started playing with Laquatus as champion, and then I started keeping track of how many games. I first I started with Mortivore, under the same concept of Lurgoyf that I'm talking to you about, and I'm like, what if what if Mortivore is too small? We can go bigger than Mortivore, right? Our decks has like cabal coffers, and so I. I kept track of how many times I beat a compost or two composts in play in tournaments, and my lifetime uh, was X and O. I never lost to a compost oh. in play. Zero percent of the time uh, playing the Laquatis champion strategy. I only lost to like matchups that I always won, which is weird. Right? I lost to uh, Upheaval Tog once, and I lost to Astral Slide with my mono black, uh, with my mono black uh, Kai Buddha deck playing for the slot. Oh, no. Like I. Uh, lost a hundred percent matchup playing for the slot. Uh, I guess it happens. Uh, but long story short, Vilquatus champion crushed all the people who thought they were going to beat Mono Black with compost. Uh, Lurgoyf. I, I think there might be a point where people are playing th- three Lurgoyfs. It's so good. The so just think about this for a second. At the t- at the point that they're going to take over the game, you have four lands in play, right? You can cast Lurgoyf. That's not the problem. If you have anger Lurgoyf, like you are doing a lot of damage to them, right? Like. He has haste. Yeah. You have more than one. They're attacking for nine each. Mm-hmm. That's a, uh, th- I think three Lurgoyf now. I'm like, in my at first, I was like, wow, well, one Lurgoyf's gonna slow them down a lot. Two Lurgoyf's gonna win the game. Three Lurgoyf's is where you actually want to be. If there's a mountain in the way, yeah. you're gonna be at the point where Monored is bringing in Tormod script against Monored. <laughs> yeah, that's they can't beat Lurgoyf. That's the that's the new game. It will be the new game is a uh, Tormod script. I am I am much closer to sold than I was five minutes ago. So, I, okay, I'm telling you right now. The second people start testing Lurgoyf in their elves versus Sly matchup, it's going to take them 30 seconds to be like, oh yeah, we should have been playing Lurgoyf all along. But Wall of Austin's is fine; you need to buy time. But the problem is you have a finite number of sideboard slots, right? So we're already talking about seven sideboard slots, six on the low end right now. I don't know what else elves needs. I'm not like a play naturalized kind of. I don't care. People are like, oh, naturalize is so good. No, it's not. It's not. People, people could have been played naturalized in a lot of formats in the last 10 years. Nobody plays it. You know why? It's not that good. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess you have, I guess specifically the elves deck needs to not have a humility in play. But <laughs> so maybe naturalize is good in that spot. So if you had to pick a best deck, what do you think of this? Uh, I think my life deck that hasn't been debuted in any tournaments yet is the best deck. Okay, you're gonna uh, looping some abeyances. Yeah, it can. I it's in my imagination. It can literally only lose to Ridge's deck. Okay, uh, that was in the finals. It beats every other deck basically all the time. So, um, the and I actually in the course of watching this figured out a sideboard card, which I I will keep to myself until the tournament <laughs> that I play it next week. That will make it really always win. Mm-hmm. So I'm really super excited uh, about my life deck. 
Um, because I think that the problem that people had with life decks previous to this is that they try to do too many things. And the things that they try to do include casting dress and cabal therapy. But you know how I feel about that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, who cares? Right? So you're talking about a deck that can play four copies each of Living Wish, Eldamry's Call, uh, Worldly Tutor. Nobody plays Lotus Petal. I don't know why you don't play Lotus Petal. Most of your combo pieces cost one, right? <laughs> like, you know, just, just, just win, right? Yeah. And they're worried about losing to Guy's Blessing. You just play your own Guy's Blessing gets around it right but the problem is rich's deck specifically can guys blessing armageddon comp like loop guys blessing in armageddon which is prohibitive any deck that's not rich's deck you will eventually lock with guys blessing abeyance it just it, it, i think people just don't wrap their head around that they're like no this is deterministic mm -hmm. if they're not playing a counter spell deck they will be locked by guys blessing abeyance at some point in the future because they can't actually kill you they can't deck you and they can't kill you with damage so at some point in the future your deck is going to be guys blessing guys blessing abeyance abeyance and that's the entire loop and the, the, at that point they'll figure out that they've lost the game but it will take a while to get there most people will just concede it's just like in the goblins matchup versus the red deck matchup for if you have a solitary confinement so like against red deck solitary confinement is a kill but against goblins it's not if they have even one naturalize and one carplus and forest each in their 60 they will eventually be yeah and people are like well, they're not going to draw. They're going to draw it. Your deck doesn't move forward, right? Mm -hmm. You actually don't kill them until until the point that they've had the opportunity to, to draw this. The same is true. In, in, but I don't know how to beat Rich's deck yet. But you know, outside of Rich's deck, like every other deck, I don't know how they would be uh, how they beat a concerted green white life combo with an advanced combo. Let's well, conveniently, your combo deck already has a breakfast cereal name. So, it oh, is what is it? Life. Life is a cereal. I don't see. <laughs> I don't know if you know this about me. I'm not a joiner. <laughs> I'm not a joiner. I don't even. I didn't even join y'all's Facebook group. People yeah. are like, "Hey, can we communicate with you Facebook." I'm like, "I suppose I don't log into Facebook, right?" So, I'm not a joiner. I just do my own thing. Mm -hmm. In my dad, this deck is called uh, Zabotan Nimanat. I don't know. I heard that somewhere. It's like you heard some commentator say the word "grok" yeah. ten years ago. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I think I think life is the best deck, right? I mean, it's. Life is glass cannon. If people want to beat it, they can. You're not going to be able to beat someone who has a lot of haunting echoes against you on their sideboard, right? Unless you have some other crazy sweet combo, which I'll figure out. You know, but we'll have to wait wait for that to happen first. Um, outside of that, I think Replenish is super overpowered. I played it because I think it's overpowered. I don't think that it is nearly as good as it was at LobsterCon if everybody's playing these decks that can win on turn three, oh. right? So all these decks are faster than Replenish. Replenish's value is not in its speed but in the fact that it, it's super asymmetrical right like everybody else plays kind of a they play a fair game like a duress is i invest one card in my hand and one mana for one card in your hand now it has an outsized amount of value if that card in your hand is an engine piece right but if you're like duressing a sly deck right they don't really care their hand is all the same you're actually just down a mana right um, so they're they're symmetrical from that same point. Like all the cards in Replenish are super asymmetrical, and I think that's that's cool. But the downside is it's much slower than uh, you know. It doesn't really win on the second turn. When like like a uh, Connor deck can win on the second turn. Right? Mm -hmm. Replenish can't win on the second turn. So uh, I don't know. There's lots of good decks. Uh, I'm probably gonna play Sly. I hate saying Sly. you guys say Sly. It's wrong. That deck is so close to a 2004 Sears Shavidia red deck wins deck, and you call it Sly. That's literally just wrong. Sly is a dude's name. He didn't even make the deck. Jay <laughs> Snyder made the deck. Right? So, anyway, red deck is really good. I enjoy playing it. People should play Final Fortune and Detonate in their sideboard instead of whatever they have, they have in their sideboard. Um, the cards they have in their sideboard are wrong. They should play Detonate and uh, Final Fortune. Are you just detonating, like, Dreadnoughts? What are you detonating? Yeah, so you want it. So here's the two things. One, you want to detonate dreadnoughts. Detonating dreadnoughts is not that much worse than overloading dreadnoughts. But the bigger thing is uh, the slide deck doesn't have. <sighs> I'm doing it now too. Doesn't have that many cards for the mirror, right? So in the mirror, I'm taking out all my all my jackal pups, which aren't horrible, but they're not very good. But if you can side in like. Um, uh, you side out your jackal pups and you side in detonates and final four uh, and like some lava darts or whatever in exchange for the cards that aren't very good in the matchup. So there's six cards that aren't very good, right? So there's four jackal pups and two uh, uh, two sulfurous vortex, and so uh, having six cards to bring in is a natural swap. So uh, I'm right now I'm bringing in four lava darts and two detonates. I don't bring in the final fortune in the in the uh, 
in the slime match. Ugh. The red deck matchup, <laughs> unless I think my opponent is either much better or much luckier than I am. Uh, but that's a very natural number of cards to swap. And uh, in any game that your opponent's going to win, they're probably going to draw at least one Curse Scroll. And so a Detonate is a good card against Curse Scroll. But an Overload is a really mediocre card against Curse Scroll. So uh, it allows you to compress your sideboard space a little bit. I would go so far that if you don't want to play a Final Fortune, you should play one Fledgling Dragon, okay. uh, which I think is a pretty good card to swap in the mirror. It's a Nambo with... Uh, uh, with uh, Grim Lava, Grim Lava Mancer, yeah. but your Grim Lava Mancer is so unlikely to live. It's so mm -hmm. unlikely to get a single activation, right? So I'm siding in four Lava Darts in the mirror. I, I just don't... I've never had somebody activate a Grim Lava Mancer against me in a sideboarding game uh, in my, all of the time that I've played pre-modern so far. Uh, so, And I think if you have one Fledging Dragon, it's relatively hard to kill. If they want to kill it, they probably have to give up a lot, right? They might have to give up four cards or something to kill it. Uh, if you get a full untap with it, you almost certainly win. The other thing about it is you could just take a ball lightning if you're going to untap with a fledging dragon. They're not going to kill it. Okay. So uh, anyway, I think that deck is really good, really strategic. I think Aaron Dix did an amazing job. I think there's still innovation to be had there. It is um, it is the deck that made me fall in love with the format. I really like Slide. Slide is super glass cannon ish, though. It can't beat any of the decks that we're looking at these days, right? Zero percent chance of beating my replenished deck. Uh, low likelihood of beating Flint's deck. I can't imagine slide beating either of these decks. If you were going to play in one of those tournaments that you run where people can pick three decks and you ban one, slide's actually a great deck because no one will ever ban it. And you can just ban the deck on their squad that can't beat that that beats slide and then just play slide and beat their beat down cards. So um, Yeah, I, I yeah, like things get that. really uh, the the branch of possibilities really open up when you talk about like bans and whatnot and the the three deck format. It really changes things, so yeah, so I, I look forward to it. If you're going to do one of those three decks banded deck formats, uh, Michael J is in. Uh, it's going to be three different bands combo decks. <laughs> so good luck banning. <laughs> All, right. All right. Shoot, I have to buy more bands. <laughs> yeah. Seven. Yeah. All right. I'm going to wrap up the stream. I'm going to uh, sign us off. But again, thank you everyone for, for watching and for the support. And, uh, Thanks again, Michael, for joining us. But until oh, next so time. Thanks so much for having me. It was a riot. Yeah. Uh, anytime, man. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.